Welcome to the Masterclass Stereotaxis Genesis, A New Era Begins. We are very happy to see so many participants online today. We are looking forward to an exciting event in which we hope you will contribute with your observations, questions, and remarks. Please note that making recordings during the uh, event is prohibited. Also, please be aware that physicians may discuss or present information on stereotaxis products or ablation catheters that may not have approval or clearance in all geographies. Always consult product labeling. During this masterclass, we encourage you to participate in the event. Feel free to use the chat functions in the Zoom control panel to pose questions or remarks. To follow the event efficiently, we ask you to switch your view to speak of you in the upper right corner of your screen. And if you like, you can switch to side-by-side -side view under the view options at the top of your screen. If you drop off from the event, you can always log back in with the same Zoom link. It is now my honor to um, introduce to you our chairperson and main moderator of the day, Dr. Tamas tsili -Turok. Clinical Head of Electrophysiology and the Robotic Lab in Erasmus Medical Center, Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, and also a board member of SCRN Society of Cardiac Robotic Navigations. With this, I hand over to you, Dr. Tsili Tarok. Thank you very much, uh, Marlutz, for this kind invitation, and um, also on behalf of um, the organizing committee, uh, I welcome everybody uh, to this uh, uh, masterclass event. This is the second masterclass event uh, we organized. And this um, today I represent, of course, Erasmus Medical Center where I work, but I also represent the Society of Cardiac Robotic Navigation. This is a society uh, that we founded um, a long time ago, first in Europe, and then uh, colleagues in uh, the United States also uh, uh, founded their um, American arm. And uh, since um, six years, we joined our effort, and now we have um, the Global Society of Cardiac Robotic Navigation. And um, one of our um, major aim and target is to promote uh, robotics. Currently, in electrophysiology, the best known robotic system is the stereotaxis system. And as you realized, uh, the title of this masterclass today is A New Era Begins. So this technology has almost two decades. And um, in the first uh, history, in the first masterclass, I demonstrated that what happened in this uh, last two decades from a procedure like PVI, which lasted more than five hours at the beginning, we could... Um, uh, with the innovations we were provided, we could do procedures six per day and um, uh, on an average procedure time less than an hour. But again, technology should go on and uh, we are all happy uh, working, and the, the guys working on this field that um, uh, major changes are implemented in the hardware. And this is the first time when uh, globally people get access to look at it and uh, uh, to have experience um, at least remotely and, and, um, uh, and to see how the new uh, generation of uh, stereotaxis magnetic navigation works. We are very happy that um, we could do it uh, together with two excellent um, stereotaxis users and two pioneering uh, labs. And first, we start in Europe, of course, based on the time differences. And I'm very happy also to introduce our main operator today, uh, who is Pekka uh, Ratikainen. He's cardiologist and uh, chief physician of um, the Basing Heart and Lung Center, Helsinki University. Um, it would take hours to tell all of the titles and achievements that he had in the past, but um, just shortly, he worked as a professor of cardiology at the University of Tampere, uh, professor of internal medicine of the University of Eastern Finland, and he also had um, uh, multiple positions in Finnish Cardiac Society, European Society, European Heart Rhythm Association, and uh, uh, he's cur currently a member of the 
uh, ESC membership committee uh, and uh, uh, task forces and treasurer of the UEMS cardiology section. So, and also um, Dr. Parika is, um, uh, he will be the on-site moderator today. Um, he will introduce, of course, the team uh, himself, but again, just a few words. He's a doctor of medicine, specialist in cardiology and internal diseases uh, in the same center at this moment. And um, um, he has also multiple achievement. He's assistant chief cardiologist, and um, he also monitored the uh, uh, catheter ablations um, remotely uh, performed by uh, PECA. And, um, and um, although they were uh, 6,000 kilometers apart, they say in their introduction, um, they could heal um, several, several patients um, together. So this is a very exciting time and um, I'm very happy uh, to participate in this. Just a few words about these master classes. So as I said, this is the second master class that we arranged. And um, every two months, the Society of Cardiac Robotic Nav Navigation that I just introduced to you guys um, will arrange a different master class and the ma major idea is to show new things or to address common misperceptions. Um, I will give the word to Helsinki, but before that, I would like also to emphasize to the audience that um, questions today will be exclusively uh, um, possible via the chat function. But on the other hand, I really would like to encourage also everybody to ask as many questions as possible because this is a very exciting time. Again, this is a um, uh, first time in the world that we can observe cases using this uh, new technology. Thanks, Thomas, for the kind, kind introductory words there that my name is Pekka Radik and I'm currently the chief of the EP here in the Helsinki University Hospital. And we've been using the magnetic navigation system in Helsinki more than 10 years. And now we are proud to present cases done, done with the new Genesis magnetic navigation system. First, I would like to thank Thomas and the Society for Cardiac Remote Navigation for arranging these master classes together with stereotypes. So big, big. Thanks also for David Fissel and his team, team and the local guys here in Helsinki, Tommy Foros and Antti Vuorinen for making the practical arrangements, as well as Marlos and Petra for logistical information. I was glad to hear that so many colleagues were possible to participate in this session. Hopefully we will learn from each other. We will have a case with a patient operative with a sending operation. I will show a couple of slides of that. And hopefully you will be able to help us if there's some, some problems during the case and hopefully we will find a nice solution for this patient. So I hope that you will be using the chat form actively and ask questions and we try to reply what we have, have here. So today we will have a couple of cases. One case is coming from Helsinki University Hospital and the other one is coming from Arizona. Peter Weiss and his team will be doing a VT case and we will do a patient patient having a sending operation for transportation ransom position of the great arteries. So this is this is the program and hopefully we will be in time. We are a little bit late here starting. We were hoping to get everything done a little bit earlier. We had it a little bit complex AVNRT case for the morning. There was a variation almost every every type of AVNRT. There was a typical, atypical and slow, slow. So it took a little bit longer to get, get everything done in that case. But we have put on the sheets in and ready to start the case with the mapping there. But I will first show some slides about our team here. As we all know, we are in the Finland, located in the northern part of Europe. And Helsinki is the capital city here at the bottom. So we are the most most southern part of the fin Finland. Finland is a long country. I used to work in Oulu, which is more than 700 kilometers north. And from Oulu, still it's more than 700 kilometers to the far north parts of Finland. This is the Meilahti Tower Hospital. We are working in the bottom floor of this, this hospital. There, the magnetic navigation laboratory is in the bottom floor. It used to be in the beginning, the magnets were so heavy that it was impossible to install the system any any upper floor. So it's the bottom floor and 
it's been working well, but we're a little bit isolated here. Few words about our facilities in Helsinki. We have two dedicated EP labs. And I think you can start doing a little bit of thumb mapping. And I was just discussing with my, co my colleague here that he can start doing a little bit of thumb mapping here already with the case there. So we have a stereo taxis lab and we are proud to have the first Genesis magnetic navigation system in the world. In the lab, we have a Claris EP recording system card of version six. Unfortunately, no newer versions of the Cardo system are supported and we can't use any, any newer version of the Cardo in the stereo taxis lab. And we have the Odyssey cinema system here. And we have another lab completely dedicated for doing cathedral ablation with Siemens pipeline fluorox copy and same Claris system and card of V7 here, and also having the inside precision system. And in fact, today and tomorrow, there will be installation of the Odyssey Cinema system also for the manual lab. We have a separated lab for pacemaker installations, and then we're doing cryo balloon ablations. We have a dedicated lab, which is the newest lab in the hospital. It's called like a special lab. Some some special cases, TAVI procedures are done there also, also on AST closures, PFO closures, left atrial appendix closures are done there. We are using the lab two days a week usually for cryo balloon ablations. We have only census EP recording system in that lab. So what we are doing in Helsinki, we do about thousand catheter ablations every year. And biggest, biggest volume is, of course, the atrial fibrillation. Currently, it's around 350 cases of AFib, so about 35% of the ablations are for atrial fibrillation. And in that addition, we have a, another lab inside the Helsinki University Hospital in the New Children's Hospital, and they're doing about 100 ablations there. And we have a close collaboration between the colleagues in the pediatric EP unit. And the device implantations are also quite active here, about 1,000 device implantations per year. So we will show a little bit more about this magnetic lab. The first Genesis magnets and the Omega medical X-ray system was installed here in Helsinki during the summer times. And we did first cases in July. And since then, we've been using this system every day, very actively doing, doing cases and currently, the most common case in the stereotaxis lab is the idiopathic ventricular extrasystole or VT cases. We, then we do sexual heart disease cases with VTs in these patients and do an epicardial ablation with the magnets. Atrial fibrillation ablations used to be the biggest volume in this lab, but now it's switched that we were doing other, other cases here and doing more cryo balloons and more manual AFib ablations. These are Important part of the magnetic lab, also these patients with congenital heart disease, they have been undergoing the surgery in the past and then they have these arrhythmias later on. So these are always done with the stereotaxis in our hospital. And in fact, we are using, using the lab also when we have the long cases in the morning, we start with the difficult cases and usually in the afternoon hours, we are doing SVT cases. And it might be nice, nice to show something also with that because we are using the Navigan screen here and we do the SVD cases practically without any floor or using these, these features in the systems, that what makes it possible. So this is a picture from the lab. You can show also live, live video later on. You can see that the Genesis magnets are smaller than the previous ones there. They are tilting a little bit different ways there, but it, it, it's very convenient to use these. And you can see the Omega X-ray system. It's a little bit bigger than the usual settings what we have had in the past. We have a 30 centimeter detector in this system. It used to be used to be in the Siemens system, what we had it in the past, 20 centimeter detector. This is usually allowing us also to see the groins there that if you have some problems with the puncture sites there. And this is our control room. We can show a little bit video here. This is Hannu Parikka at the front there, and I'm in the back in this picture. Picture, we have the Odyssey screen, and in fact, we have like a duplicate of these systems here. And then sometimes when we are doing VT cases, the other one is using the pacing system and measuring here. The other one is turning the catheter, catheter and trying to find, find the critical isthmus there. It's very nice when you have a little bit unstable VT going on that the other one can focus on mapping and trying to do the ablation. And the other one is ready to base convert the patient 
if hemodynamics are getting getting worse. So I don't go for details in these good patients. Tell that what we are doing usually. Usually, Hannu Parikka, if we have time, something between the case, a little bit pause or something like that. Hannu will give a general presentation about the treatment of the arrhythmias in good patients. There, just a few few things there that it is very common to have these arrhythmias. Then usually they are coming up later, later several years after or ten years, decades after the surgery. And these are several symptomatic quite often that patients are feeling really badly with these arrhythmias. And it's common to have two to one conduction, even one to one conduction fast ventricular responses, which makes it difficult for the patient. And they are occurring quite easily after the cardioversion and medication is not effective in every, every cases. And so we have to do ablations quite often in these patients. So let's go for today's case. He's a 34 year old male, a little bit northern part of Finland, a few hundred kilometers from here, concerning the transposition of the great arteries and sending operation was done at a nine months age there. And during the full up for the first, first years, there was no symptoms and no signs of complications. During the recent years, there has been moderate obstruction of the LV outflow tract most likely caused by some movement of the mitral valve and moderate tricuspid regurgitation. And then at the end of 2014, he started to have palpitations. They put an implantable rubric order for the patient in the central hospital and there was documented having a nice, nice documentation of tachycardia, regular tachycardia, which had the same, same complex morphology as during the normal sinus rhythm. This is not the usual way that usually usually we are doing perhaps easier the EP study, but it was nice in this case that the ILR documented the arrhythmia. So this is the second EP study and ablation for this guy. In 2016, we did an EP study. We were, inducting, were able to induce three different atrial tachyarrhythmias in the patients. They were going around the atriotomy scar, close, close to the powerful in the right atria and then also also using the common isthmus area between the right and left atrium. We treated through this tachycardia successfully, ablating only from the right side. We didn't go retrograde or transeptally to the left, left side there because the tachycardia third one was slow and non-sustained. And it, later on, it's easy to tell that it was a correct solution in that time because the patient was without any arrhythmias almost for four years, but last summer he started to have tachyarrhythmias again. So this is an EGG from the central hospital, 50 minutes per second, taken, taken during the tachycardia. It seems to be that there's some, some P wave activity here, possibly here, here also. And these are the limb leads and here are the chest leads. Are both together here. And the morphology of the QRS complex is the same as during the normal, normal sinus rhythm in this case. operation it seems to be that the coronary sinus is in the other side of the buffle so you, we, we were not able to get the catheter inside the coronary sinus so we are using it a little bit higher in the right side hopefully it will be a stable position for the mapping there every time when you have patients with congenital heart diseases you'll have to consider that what is the access to the heart sometimes you don't have direct access to the heart and in these cases, like, like sending a mustard, you can do the buffle punk, so get, get to the left side. Or with the stereotaxis, it's really nicely done also retrograde via the aorta. Aorta, we have done both ways for the sending a mustard cases, cases to ablation. In fact, we have done a couple, couple atrial fibrillation ablations also in patients without any access to the heart. From the IVC, only having the accessory, uh, the ven venous return to the Hard via the azucos system, and it can be can be done. PV isolation can be done nicely. Retrogradely also, it has been shown nicely. So in this case, it's a little bit tricky to evaluate the PV morphology during the tachycardia. It seems to be white like regular tachycardia, and now we are getting to the EP lab. And so what we will see first that 
we can shortly switch to the tacky card and seems to be that we have a little bit different situation here so we'll have to I have a hypothesis that we thought that we'll have a nice nice plateau going on we may be wrong but we will we will go shortly after presenting that there so our approach is always that we use the 3d mapping system and it's done the mapping is done we are using the magnetic system there also and if the patient is in sinus rhythm when he's presenting to the lab we do like a substrate map before inducing the tachycardia either during sinus or cs pacing and we try to find all the double potentials and fragmented signals which are the areas of interest for the tachycardia and maybe may be working as a substrate and after that, we'll induce the tachycardia. And often, when we have the catheter already in the scar area, it might be possible to start ablating there. And if the patient has the ongoing tachycardia, we do 3D electronic map during the tachycardia. Differentiate is it, is it a focal or macro orientated tachycardia? And we'll try to find also all the, all the abnormal signals during the tachycardia. And the entrainment is usually done at the end there. We don't want to do in the beginning of the procedure there because it may convert the patient back to sinus rhythm or it may induce atrial fibrillation. But occasionally it's done before ablating just to make sure that we have the correct diagnosis. So when we go for the live, live we will check a little bit of the stability of the tachycardia, see the activation sequence sequence there it's not not so easy now we can't have the catheter in the coronary sinus because it's in the other side of the buffalo there and then we will find find what is the cycle length can we cover the whole cycle length in the right atrium will start from the right now and then if necessary go through the buffalo to the left side so hopefully there will be focal or macro and tachycardia which we can map today and then confirm it and then then hopefully successfully ablate it so perhaps tommy tommy can turn the cameras a little bit and we can show our our team here in the live presentation you can start from the lab there and so i think that it's it's live now in the picture there that Tommy will be turning it a little bit this is this is okay now you can see also the signals already inside on the card screen and here we have the camera inside the lab the magnets are here table for preparation is here and sterile sterile table here and then we have the big monitors here and hopefully you can zoom a little bit and we can see that we're usually having Couple, couple nurses and their working station. He is in the corner today. We should have Anne, Anne and Laura here, but they are hiding behind the monitor. And you can switch to the control room. The size of the lab is not so big, but it's enough for these these cases. And we can have a, also the respirator inside the lab and do the cases in general anesthesia if needed. Usually AFib ablations and these kind of ablations, what we are doing today are done, done and conscious sedation and all the structural VT cases, patients with structural heart disease and VTs are done during general anesthesia. Can you switch to the control room? I can't see what, what you are seeing on the other side here, but this, this should be now in the control room. I'm waving my hand here and Hannu, Hannu is working here on the what do you say screen starting to do in the case case there and let's go go and continue with the case case and hopefully we will find the solution for this guy now it seems to be back in the sinus room it was for a while tachycardia going on and it may be maybe that it's a little bit more simple tachycardia even there that we will find it is it working Echo. Uh, all right Thank you very yes. much. So just the feedback, uh, we can hear you and we can see you very well. I hope it's true for all participants. Okay. Um, and um, seems to be a very excellent and exciting case. But before um, we go into it, of course, one of the ideas is to talk a little bit, um, not a little bit, but a lot about the Genesis system. And you are one of the person 
who has now experience uh, with the genesis and, um, and very long experience with a uh, stereotaxis system. So maybe you can uh, say a few words about um, uh, patient setup. So whether it's because most of the guys logged in are stereotaxis users and we are very eager to see uh, the new version. So yeah. um, if you can highlight the differences, the similarities, and maybe um, now you have enough patients to talk a little bit about the reliability of the of the system which is also a very important question okay yeah I, we can discuss that while Hanu Hanu is starting to doing doing the mapping there so we have had the genesis system now for a few months and it's been working extremely well we had some some problems in the beginning and still some solution has been looking looking for some solution fine-tuning the x-ray system there and in the beginning, we had it a huge problem because biosense refused to activate the remote magnetic module in the cargo system there. And so we, we lost about a month there. We had to use the systems side by side. And now we are using the cargo six with the fully integrated cargo system like in the past. Big differences between the Genesis and old old magnets there that it's, it's not so huge when you're using the system. It's a little bit easier perhaps to put the patient here because the magnets are a little bit smaller. It allows us sometimes to get the magnets closer to the patient. It may increase the magnetic field there, that it may be better to maneuver the catheter, there, but we haven't done any, any comparison like that. So it's theoretically it's there, but it's difficult to say, is it, is it really working? And when the doctor is working using this Odyssey system here, it's the same. So it, I think it's, it's a good way in a way that your working flow is the same as a, as a doctor. You are using the same screens there. And we prefer to always to use the cargo system here because we are always manipulating the catheter using, using the cargo screen. If you are using an inside, what has been done also in some, some other places and we were considering it during the summertime also, then you have to use side by side. And I think Peter Weiss will be doing a case case later on today using the inside system and we will see the differences when you're using the system side by side then you have to use this navigant screen for changing the catheter position here but we are usually having having the x-ray background here we can see a little bit what is going on in during the case and then we have the cargo screen doing the final brace moving the vector with the cargo system here on the other hand, if, if new installation is done, I think it's a beneficial also that these magnets are much lighter than the old ones. So you don't have to put so much support on the floor. And like I mentioned in the beginning in Helsinki, this lab is now downstairs because it was impossible to put it one floor higher where we have all the other cat labs there because we couldn't support the floor. These magnets would have been possible to install also, also in the high of lore. So in the in the during the case we can work almost like in the past. I can't really tell that it's, it's a theoretically that these magnets may be a little bit faster but to be honest I can't really see it while doing the cases. It used to be with the first magnets, first generation magnets that they were so slow that you can turn the vector weight and drink a cup cup of coffee and then continue. But they also the epic magnets, but they were moving so fast that you can't really see that it's almost like one to one movement in the catheter with the Genesis magnets. And but I can't really tell you that is it, is it any faster? You really have to do specific measurements to show it. But like you see here, when Hanno is doing doing the mapping here and turning the vector, the catheter is really moving immediately to the same, same direction as, as the vector is turned. Of course, it may have some structures blocking there. I like these new new magnets there. It, it, it's good to finally we got the integration with the cargo system. What I would right like to see in the future is that we would have a little bit more close collaboration also with, with Biosense or perhaps the other companies are providing us also fully integrated systems for mapping there. That I know that Atlas is already having having system which can be integrated with the cargo system in the stereotax <laughs> with the stereotaxi system. Sorry. Sorry, but it's it's only for atrial fibrillation ablation, and like I mentioned, most of our cases are now not AFib, but it, it's switching to the VF cases and cases like this today. There, so I don't know, Thomas, this did answer a little bit your question there. Then, if you want to ask some some really specific questions about 
about the system, please, please. No, absolutely. I think th th this, this is what we all want with, to know. And I, I think it's nice to hear actually that uh, the workflow didn't change a lot. So there is no new learning curve involved in this. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I also feel that it's important in a way. And yeah, and then the have other to completely this, this change your approach. It's, it's tricky and it yeah. makes it difficult. Difficult and the speed us. we will see, I think, in a, in a, when we gain some more experience. I have one more specific question um, yes. about the. You mentioned the Omega system and the uh, um, patients with a possible femoral excess problem. So um, I think it's very important that everybody understands that. Uh, if you want, you can also visualize the the femoral region. Is that correct? Yeah, we have had only one extremely tall patient that we couldn't visualize the femoral region with, with this, this system. There. But that was something that we were really afraid in the beginning because you can't change the position of this X-ray system. It's there. But with the 30 centimeter detector, when you use it in the normal position, the area is so wide that we have had only one one patient we couldn't couldn't really see see the groin area there, so we've been positively surprised with this because that was something what we were really worried. What I would have done differently if I had been planning this system, I would have have a roof mounted system there because then you can turn turn the table higher enough and you can see easily there. But this is a floor mounted system which is approved having a G mark and approved in the US, so there's nothing we can do with this. But so far, it hasn't been a major problem, and we were really happy with this. Very nice, thank you. And again, I uh, would like to encourage everybody to ask in a chat function if you have questions about the uh, system. Um, and otherwise, I give back the word, and now we can focus on the patient, which is, of course, the most yeah. important thing today. Yeah, Hanno is doing the mapping here, and it seems to be that the patient is going going in sinus rhythm and then there's tachycardia, which seems to be that it's, it's quite simultaneous activation in all GS channels there. But we will do the anatomical math first, then we will do a little bit induction with the pacing and see what's going to happen there. As you can see that it's quite nicely, nicely moving there. This is now, you can see my mouse, I hope so. Yeah, yeah so you can see it. So Hanno is doing the mapping here and you can manipulate the catheter quite nice. And this CS catheter is towards the, the right atrial appendix there. I think that the CS is in the other side of the baffle there. That quite commonly in our, our patients, what has been operated in Helsinki, Helsinki, the CS is in the right side. So we can get the catheter to the CS from here. But we were trying it last time and it, I tried it again, again in the beginning procedure, but couldn't get it there. So. This seems to be quite quite stable position for the catheter now. We can get to the SVC, and this is this is a nice in the navigation screen when you have the floor in the background. It helps helps the mapping there. You can see it nicely there, and this is the feature I'm always using also for AFib ablation. Taking the taking the floor of the, in AFib ablation, it's usually only only AP AP, and you can see it nicely. This helps a little bit. You can see the IVC we're getting with the catheters inside here. CS catheter is here, close to the appendix there. We can get to the ventricle. I think Hanno has some, some marks already in the annulus. Flight dots are usually what we are using location only points for the annulus there. Uh, and now Hanno hasn't you taken any, any points there. Yeah, Let's, may I ask something? You mentioned in the introduction um, that once you have to go to the pulmonary venous atrium, um, of course, we have two options. Uh, which option you will uh, demonstrate today? Because now you are mapping the systemic venous atrium, but uh, yes, uh, will you go retrograde or? Um, uh, or we will, we will, uh, today we have decided that if we can induce a tachycardia, which is, which is coming with this most dependent tachycardia or something else that we have to go for the left side, we, we will prefer to do it today the way we are the buffalo and do the trump set, septal puncture there and we can look that that but if we can't really induce any tachycardia which is coming from the left side of course we don't go there and last last time we didn't go for the left side because it seemed to be that we were able to ablate some of the tachycardias from the right side but we will see now what's what's going to happen when we get get the tachycardias going on and 
it was a little bit funny tachycardia what was there for a while and it may be maybe even that we have a simple SVT here but we will see sure, now sure. The sinus rhythm and this is this is something that Hanu now decided to do, do the just the anatomical map without taking the points there because the rhythm was a little bit irregular going for the tachycardia going for the sinus Okay, so usually we do the substrate map during the sinus rhythm or the during CS pacing and perhaps we can switch to CS pacing also and then try to find, oh, by now it's getting getting to the tachycardia again. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about the tachycardia in the audience? You can see it, see it here. Regular tachycardia, CS is here, mapping catheter is here, almost simultaneous activation in all, all the CS channels ablation can have about the same time, very short retrograde conduction time there. Any comments? What, what, what's, what's your feeling? What, what we have to do? There are no comments so far. No comments so far. I, I, I mean, you mentioned retrograde conduction, but of course, it's not yet proven that it's retrograde conduction. Um, so yeah, yeah, it, it may be, may be also also that this is very very slow undergrade conduction. You are right. There was some some ventricular pacing in the beginning. It seems to be that we have a decremental conduction there, some sometimes blocking. But we will we will do a little bit testing there. But let let Hanno Hanno finish the map. So we have a nice anatomical background. We always want to have a nice nice anatomical background there that it's it's much easier to do the ablation also when you know the anatomy and you have perhaps marked also the fragmented signals or something like like that did you have to find any any areas with fragmentation or double potential so far there's some some okay Hannu can put the microphone also on so he can comment comment during the mapping mapping phase also that there's one one area here that he has marked in the lateral part that there's there's double potential marked with these blue dots there that Hanu can show okay. the signal there what, what we have in this yeah. this area there okay i suppose you can hear my voice yes uh, yeah okay the only peculiar potentials i i found so far was this uh where these two sides of, of double potentials they were quite wide uh, distance, but uh, this one here. Oh, actually, the tachycardia is going on. It's it's not so easy to demonstrate the double potential anymore. Yeah, you but can see it, the distal, it distal part rhythm. that it, yeah. it's some some fragmentation there but yeah. i think hanu if it's so stable oh no, no just i was telling that it, it seems to be so <laughs> stable that we can we can take some points yeah. and after the it, but now it's gone yeah. gone so it seems to be that it's, it's so going unstable and going and staying for a while perhaps we can do such, just some basic basic ep things that we can try to paste the ventricle see what does it like look for the va conduction there and perhaps we can try also also to give some atrial stimulation there and see what's what's happening there okay i had the impression i had the impression that the va time is not that much stable but of course it's difficult to see it remotely and it is very interesting maybe uh, you guys can comment on uh, and that shows the difference between mustard and uh, sending operation in this case that you see much more healthy tissue and it's something to do with the way how the baffle is um, uh, uh, formed in uh, in these patients, uh, and it's completely different from the master. Although the anatomy is, is the same, maybe you guys can comment on it. In many countries, uh, there is no uh, experience with the uh, sending because uh, it's a later operation, and on those countries, they already started the, the arterial switch operation. I'm also very lucky because I worked in Hungary and then we always had only sennings and um, in the Netherlands is mostly mustard. Um, but again, uh, anatomy is um, almost exactly the same, very, um, but um, the pathologic signals and fibrotic tissues are um, different in these two operations. Maybe I'm very curious to see your opinion. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. That it, 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 it depends a little bit what is the material used for the for the making making the tunnel there. It's a little bit differences in that there. I'm not sure if Anders Kirstein is online. Can I can Anders has been working? Is Anders there? That Anders is the best guy in this this, this world I know for <laughs> arranging, giving giving a nice 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 talk about these these. Uh, can I can Anders you can can give take a mic and give give comments there? That because I think that you are the much much better than I in this this comparing the sending and master than giving giving the hints what what we should be looking there. Is Anders there? Okay, Hanno is doing a little bit mapping, and I will take some some points here. Also. He's there, actually. He's there. He gave you uh, already a nice chat message that he's watching. But uh, the point we already agreed that um, because it's a large audience, we will not allow uh, people to talk. Okay, yeah, that's what what was asking in the last last time we did cases with Anders a couple of weeks ago, and I was asking stereotypes that they will give Anders access to the okay. microphone also. <laughs> also, that that's why that's why I was asking. asking we can make an exception. No <laughs> because I think that he's he's the best guy to comment on this. I don't see the chat there. That we can look for now. now looking from the Thomas Thomas computer. All right. Can you give me, give, me, give me in the chat some some comments about the differences between master and sending? What is what is your feeling that it's the key issues in this this? If you don't have access to the microphone, perhaps you can just type short short comments on the on the chat screen there, and we can we can discuss those. It's a pity that we didn't get this. Our microphone should be open for Anders. Yes, okay. okay, Anders. He has a mic on himself. Mm -hmm. Let's take some of the points here. Do we get it? We still don't hear Anders. Dr. Peterson, your microphone is open. Okay, do you hey. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Yes, super. It, uh, it was uh, just a problem of, of the difference between the sending and the mustard and naturally. I think uh, basically it, it looks, they look very much alike. Yeah. And uh, the only difference uh, perhaps uh, occurs when, uh, uh, or due to the age of operation, uh, since uh, uh, most of the people we have done in, together in, in, uh, in Finland, they look very much alike. There might be some differences in, in uh, the incisions. Uh, last time we were worked together, uh, Pekka, we had this uh, mustard operated case where uh, sometimes the surgeon put in an extra incision in the very lateral place of the, the baffle of the right atrium in order to enlarge uh, the, the uh, baffle and also uh, allow for better uh, transition of the, uh, ven uh, the pulmonary venous blood, the red blood, uh, when the patient grows up. So there are kind of tiny differences, but basically you can expect to see the the, the, the same uh, microscopic anatomy uh, as depicted here in the in the castle yeah, system. Yeah, this is getting quite typical typical anatomy of you now in the picture. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that uh, maybe you misunderstood, but that was my point too. What my point was that in a setting, based on the fact that they use less artificial material because it's uh, made from the own heart. Uh, you have a um, different um, level of fibrotic tissues, which seemingly less than in a master. That was my point. Yeah, 
I, yeah. I, I agree with you that that, 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 yeah. that, that might turn up as a different. So I was able to get some some points during the tachycardia. Hannu tries to induce it again. Uh, we see what's going to be there. I can paste from CS12. Okay, now it started <laughs> again. Let's take some some more points and then go. There's areas like like here that we have nice nice double potential it was during the sinus also mm -hmm. here we, we can mark those also here here so we have some something something going on in this area this might be the opening area this <coughs> is a little bit tricky now it's a huge this may be maybe coming from the ventricle sometimes it's a little bit tricky to separate here that do we have a double potential or is, is it coming only only the ventricle potential and the, big big atrial potential here so one of the thing um, what i'm doing in those cases um, i make sure that um, i um, i map the valves both valves on both sides very accurately yeah. anat anatomically because uh, the way how the surgery is performed in those cases uh, many tachycardias are running in 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 a, in a systemic and a pulmonary venous atrium uh, using um, the tissue which actually separates them artificially but it's uh, it's the same tissue so um, in a large amount of cases um, even in just a normal isthmus dependent flutter you really have to ablate in both atria that's and right yeah to understand this what i i, I emphasize during the mapping of of the accurate um, accurate identification of the of the two annuluses yeah that that's important there usually when you have have this this right side and you have the annulus located and then you take the left side and usually you'll have to start from the left left annulus and when you have both areas mapped it's it's nice to continue towards the ivc area there and then mm -hmm. i don't remember many many times that i've been able to ablate the isthmus from the right side it's 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 quite few cases that we've been able to ablate the isthmus all, only from the left side and it's, it's a complete block after that that there but quite commonly like you mentioned that you have to ablate in the both sides sides there but it would be so nice to have a nice stable tachycardia and this is this is not so easy now the mm -hmm. tachycardia is going on and so stopping shortly and difficult to induce it and may, may i have a comment here yes. yeah. Yeah, the, the, I really like the, the way you have annotated the, these uh, double potentials that you see both in sinus and in uh, tachycardia yeah. because they, they are really important. They represent the, the original incision in the lateral right atrium. That's right, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very, very important to identify this incision. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, no, now we got it. Now we got it something else there that this is this is much yeah. much faster. Like it, this might be now some some macro reentry. Perhaps we will try to map this. We have to do a remap now and yeah. it's completely and it's about 200. So we can go for minus. This is also very well known, right? <laughs> yes. I would like I, like I mentioned in the thought introduction there that. You commonly get get different kind of tachycardias. Last time we were able to get three different kind of tachycardias in this case, and um, now we have, have, have the double potentials already. Now I have another have question. Um, I don't know whether Sabine will um, log in or not, but um, probably she would already ask. Um, um, is in your routine to um, to implement um, three uh, procedure imaging like CT in those cases. Yeah, that's that's something I've been <laughs> discussing stuff in many times, and I I really invite that. It, it's it's nice that she's having the access and easily easily getting those. We don't have so nice access for this, and it's it common commonly that we do it with, without any any pre pre CT or MRI. I think Sabine is mainly using MRI, and it's really nice nice to have a nice nice MRI pictures because then you don't have 
get the patient any radiation and it, it is really neat in that way. We've been discussing a lot and perhaps perhaps it should be that we will increase it in the future, but so far it's, it's been mainly, mainly doing the cases without any, any CT or MRI in advanced care. But And from time to time, uh, of course, um, as a moderator, uh, I have to uh, go back uh, to the uh, fact that we are demonstrating here uh, Genesis. And um, Pekka can also explain that um, this is one of the most difficult procedure, at least complex procedure that we've performed um, in the EP lab. So uh, can you say something about the um, kind of uh, the, the range of procedures? How, how did you start with a new system? You started immediately with a wide range of procedures, focusing on everything, just following the routine you already had with an old stereotaxis system, or you introduced this uh, gradually uh, in your routine and you started with simple procedures and when the confidence improved you started to do the the most difficult procedures i think oh. it's it's important for starting uh, centers to understand this yeah we, we made the switch in a way that we started immediately doing afib cases with the system we didn't didn't ah. oh now it stopped <laughs> got a few points so, so yeah, we, i'll try to we were confident we were seeing seeing how the system was working and when the other screen was here the same same things were there that we started we, we did it in the beginning many many APIP cases and we quite fast we did also some some vp cases and we already done some some patients with the sending and mustard operations in, the, in, in this and some epical ablation has been also also done so we were confident that this system is going to work like like in the past and we started we didn't do, do any any simple flutter cases or anything like that we started and we felt that in, in fact <laughs> AFIP cases are considered simple cases nowadays <laughs> when you have some some macro and tachycardia after the AFIP population that's a different story but AFIP cases are usually the simple cases so in that way we started with the simple cases <laughs> Getting, getting, AFIP is nice, nice in the way that it allows us to do nice mapping there. That allows us to use the system, get, get all the, all the mapping done quite nicely there. And in the beginning, like I mentioned, that we had the problem with the biosense that we couldn't get the RMD module. They, they refused to put it, put it here. They said that it's not tested enough, enough. And we were using, using the Navigant screen to move, move the catheter, and we felt a little bit. How do you put it? Cumbersome. It, it wasn't so nice for us because if you've been using using the Navigant screen screen to move the catheter, it might be much easier. But we always done it in the Carter system, and we want to get everything integrated so it's easier in that way. And but if so, you talk about no, no major major slowing down, going directly quite fast with the normal normal flow in the stereotactic lab. So if you talk about confidence, uh, specifically about congenital uh, patients, by the way, would you do congenital patients uh, manually in the future? <laughs> like I mentioned during my introduction there, that if I, I have the choice, I can select, I will do it always with the stereotaxis. I think a year or two ago, we were doing, doing with under, with under a couple, couple of cases here and some, somehow, we couldn't use the magnet, so you can do it do it manually also. But if I have the choice, I always always want to do it with the stereotaxis system. It's so much easier. By it's the way, I can to also... manipulate the catheter to the different areas there, and doing retrograde ablation manually. I've done it done it in the past past several several years ago, a couple of times, but I I wouldn't try to try to do it and. I've never tried to do an AFib ablation retrograde. I've done it nicely with the stereotaxis. So in these cases, I, I would really use the magnets. In the meantime, I'll tell you also in secret, um, the very first uh, congenital case in Budapest, I hope he still remembers, we also did together with Anders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that's, I can mention was, that, that was the reason that I wanted. One 20 years ago. There because he's, he's the guy in the Europe to. Give, give us, us hints with the congenital cases and 
I'm, I'm many years I've, ago. I've been able to work with Anders, Anders in, over the years, many, many, many times. And I always enjoy working with Anders. <coughs> so we got it the same, same tachycardia going on. There may be something that we'll have to check those annotations there in this double potential area. I, I try always to put, put the signal to the first, first spike here. Some of these seems to be that it's, it's perhaps annotated wrongly there. And just to update you so far, there are no questions from the audience. Okay. Hopefully but again, please ask freely and we can, um, we can um, tell to the operators. Yeah, this is, this is a little bit frustrating just to, just to try to map, map for a while and get the tachycardia and then it's converting and then we'll have to do something else. else. But now we got it the same, same faster tachycardia going on. We try to get an idea what's going on with this, this tachycardia. Eka, what is your approach if you end up with, um, let's say, six, seven different tachycardias? <laughs> I want to want to update the most table first and then then try to try to find the other ones. <laughs> yes, I don't think that there's anything else else we can do. That if you have a nice nice shorter shorter runs and a little bit more stable, try to try to eliminate one by one. And in atrial fibrillation cases, post post aortic cases and things like that, you may have a nice nice idea of the substrate and but just to ablate the substrate if it's done only mainly mainly in the vt cases and otherwise it's a little bit in the atrial doing doing just like some lines on the face of the substrate without having a nice nice idea that is this really going to be the substrate but perhaps not not so eager to go for that but sometimes it's, it's an own, only possibility what we can think think that try to find the substrate and that's perhaps the only only solution in those multiple it's it's the same but for somehow the ischemic VTs are much more clear in a way that the substance is quite clear and in fact we don't anymore in, even induce the tachycardia in the beginning we try to try to just eliminate the substrate and then then try to induce it after that but in the atrial level we haven't got it so, so much in the yes. meantime we have a question to you guys yep. uh, whether um in any, in any cases, intracardiac echo facilitated your procedure, or do you use it sometimes? In, yeah, I didn't mention in the beginning. We are not so often using using the intracardiac echo in these cases, but we've done a lot a lot of cases for extrasystole coming from the outflow track area. So we've been, we've been using it quite much in those cases. It gives us a nice hint that is the is the focus in the aortic route. Is it in the left outflow track? Is it in the right? Because more and more cases now are coming that we are even even scheduling the patient that this is going to be outflow tach tachycardia from right or left or, or from the coronary cuff sphere. Then in those cases they're using using the cardio sound catheters and it has been helpful in those cases. But so uh, nice specifically have... in, in these cases that was the question. Yes, not so much. No, no. This this is what I'm usually doing without it. Okay, now it's only only getting to the ventricle signals scattered. What about you? Are you using using ice catheter? I know that in, in Rotterdam you're using it much more than us, us, but we've been happy with the kind of sound catheter that it's been helpful. You get the nice, nice anatomical pictures with it also. Yeah, yeah. So this question was from Laszlo, uh, uh, Shaggy from Seged, uh, and they also use a lot. Um, but in this case, our experience is very similar to you. Um, I mean, we use a really a lot, as you know but yeah. not for these congenital cases. And okay. even I can tell you, um, I try to do retrograde mapping if, um, if it's possible. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you have to do buffer uh, puncture because of valves, for instance, and then you don't get access. And th in those yeah. cases, I highly recommend to identify the puncture site with um, a transesophageal at echo rather than eyes and asking a um, congenital specialist because you can much, they, they know those hearts uh, echocardiographically much better. And with ice, it's very difficult to get um, the real optimal spot for the puncture. Mm. We have a nice, nice experience in here. We've been using it. It's, it's, there's an available, very thin 
the probes. They're extremely thin and you can put it via the nose without any general anesthesia. So nowadays, if you have a difficult transeptal puncture, we are always taking the nasal T probe and use that, not anymore the ice catheter. It's a, it's a reusable catheter. You can use it multiple times. It's something like 20,000 euros, but it's, it's use, useful forever. So that's what we've been using now. Now, and it, it's used also in our hospital for PFO closures, ASD closures, and also, also for left atrial appendix closures. So it, it's a really nice tool that if you have, have the nasal thin probe for which can you use, use nasally there, that's, that's a nice PE probe. And it, after we got it that, I think, was it, was it a year ago, something like that, I think we skipped, year and we half, haven't yeah. done any, any difficult transept punctures anymore with the ice catheter, we're always using this. Mm. You don't have to put the patient on sleep and you can do it when the, while the patient is awake. It, it's really nice. I don't know if anybody else has experience with that, but it, it's, it's an excellent tool. Yeah, I agree. We, we use usually um, normal tea, but um, we also have experience with the nasal probe. Um, yeah. Routinely, we don't use it. It was more like a study, but um, I agree it's a great tool. Yeah. When you have the normal tea probe, it's, it's difficult for the patient and they don't feel, feel nice, nice with the normal yeah, tea probe. We, we, we only use for anesthesiology procedures. That's right, yeah. When you mm -hmm. have the anesthesia, it's a different story. Okay, this seems to be the other tachycardia yeah. now. This is the slower one. Now the, it it's seems one to be to one the, conduct, yeah, conduction. Yeah, it's one to one conduction now, but this is this is 290 millisecond. No. Now we can see that it's an atrial tachycardia. Yeah. There was a, I don't know, we got, it, got it there that there yeah. was an AV block for a while. So perhaps we'll have to now now try to map this one. <laughs> so it, this is this is this is a nice nice typical live case. <laughs> So far, only two tachycardia. So let's do another map. I have to pause this one. Let's try to get it. We got it something something here. It, it may be that we have something going around. I would have liked to get something. There was early early signals here, and in the other side, a little bit later signals. So it may be something something also also around this this scar area here, but can't really make make it sure and now we'll have to map for the other one so let's let's do a remap and now it seems to be 290 milliseconds we are usually taking something like 10 percent away from the side of length there so my question becomes very relevant what what will you do with the sixth or the seventh tachycardia <laughs> <laughs> yes. So far, we have only two, so I can't answer yet. Oh, now we are getting getting another. Oh, it's stabilized back. That it seems to be that it was already getting almost mm. like atrial fibrillation. And this is this is this is interesting area because also during the tachycardia, we always have these nice nice double potentials in this area. Now it's double mm. potential are getting more narrow, closer closer to each other. Usually, it's the meaning that it's the pivot point for the tachycardia. It may be may be turning around in that area, and then it's getting more more separated. It is is usually in the middle of the scar area there. But oh, this is interesting. We have getting getting very late signals here, almost having having. going on until you work um, i would like to comment on one thing yes unfortunately it's not completely relevant for this procedure but um, uh, the audience should recognize that um, uh, the other system which is fully integrated with the stereotaxis system is the acutus system and um, in the acutus uses a basket with um, uh, the capability of echo transducers having a, a very accurate anatomical map, but also a very fast um, uh, global map. So it, it's a pity that in this anatomy it could be very difficult, but um, for instance, a post PVI of a post maze patient, when we end up with many morphologies, 
it is just a relief to have a diagnosis of different tachycardias within a few seconds per tachycardia. And then uh, um, you save the time of the sequential mapping of um, 25, 30 uh, minutes per tachycardia, including, of course, the switching from one to another. So I, I really hope that those devices will be um, uh, very soon uh, tested in these environments as well. Here, there are some anatomical um, problems, and it's very difficult to put um, in the target chamber in many cases. But again, the ones who use those global L, uh, LA of global RA mapping technologies um, would feel it as a relief. And, and the other thing is when you have a lot of uh, scar tissue, it is very difficult uh, to uh, determine the isthmus of the tachycardia uh, during sequential mapping when it becomes too um, complex. And, and with those mapping systems like the Equitus, um, uh, you can very nicely um, identify it. It was just a remark. Um, uh, we are fan of this technology, again, mostly for post maze of post-PVI complex patients. Yeah, I fully agree. With it. It's a really promising technology and you can get extremely fast anatomical maps with it. And hopefully it will be that we will get, get the system also also in the level that it can be used also in the ventricles there. So far it's only only useful in the atria, atria site there. And, but it, it may be that it's some, some switches are going, going to be happening then and it will be more, more like a contact mapping in the ventricles there. But I, I completely agree. It's a promising 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 tool and what I have seen and we haven't been using it we had uh, lots of lots of discussions and tested tested but so far we haven't been testing and I know that Thomas has been doing doing evaluations in, in, in Rotterdam and you have nice nice experience with that and good to hear that it, it seems to be promising there because it's it's getting getting the fast anatomy it, it, it is valuable in some cases yeah and especially when a changing tuck is, you can uh, make the diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we got it. Some, there's, there's, there's some delay in this, this area. So we got it, got it something around the annulus area here, but not, not could, uh, couldn't really get a bigger what, what's, what's going on there. I will mark a little bit more of these annulus points perhaps. Yeah, Hannu can try to induce the tachycardia. Which one? We don't know. <laughs> Okay, Which one the, do you this want? Is still the low one. Yeah, this is the same what we've been mapping. Yeah, I'm a little bit faster. A little bit, yes. Mm. No, no, it's no, no, it's, it's two nines. <laughs> Any other questions? Please use Q&A or chat. Um, then I, I, I would like to have a very provocative question. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure that you read it, but we recently published the paper. Um, and um, that paper was initiated from my, um, based on my frustration in those cases, what you are actually doing now, uh, a few years ago. And in these cases, I apply um, many times um, similar technique uh, as in the VTs, um, almost like scar homogenization technique. And um, so that, that's the reason why these cases, I usually start with a very um, extensive pacing protocol to see what kind of uh, ATs and how many I can induce. And especially we cannot identify a um, very obvious clinical tachycardia I try to go with the scar homogenization technique for all of them. It seems to be not an extremely good um, outcome, but definitely not bad, not worse than um, the sequential mapping. So the conclusion of that paper was that if you have more than three, four tachycardias, um, mm, you will have high recurrence rate, which is of course not a surprise, yeah. but with this scar homogenization technique, you can achieve a, a very similar success rate to sequential mapping. Yeah, I mean, in these cases, it's a little bit, little bit difficult now that only, only on the face of the 
subset map that you have to go and go now also to the pulmonary atria and try to try to map that. And now we, what we have here is, is this line of double potentials. Last time we were ablating from here to, to the inferior vena cava. It seems to be that there's some, some delay here. I don't know. Should we get, get rid of these double potentials or what, what, what would be the target for the ablation here? Don't have nice, nice long fragmented signals here now. Only, only this is, this is a narrow double potential, a little bit broader double potential, that narrow double potential there that, like in the VTs, you may have nice fragmented signals or you have these late potentials here that what would be the, what would be the target here? Do you think, Thomas, that if you can't, can't really map this tachycard, we should be doing something for this one, then, then go for the pulmonary aid, we are mapped that and eliminate all the double potentials or what, what, what might be the, might be the solution. Was it a question or a comment? <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, yeah, yeah, do you recommend us to ablate these, these double potentials or what, 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 what might yeah, be? Yeah, so might what be, we can't we, really map these. What we do, we, we, we then, oh, then... We have then, a nice fit potential here, let's mark that. So that, that is based on bipolar yeah. voltage mapping. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, we should be changing and taking this, this button. Back. Some, something like I use usually 0 0.1, 0 0.5. Having, having a, a 0.2 or 0.1 there. That, so not, I mean, just looking looking the signals, what we have been seeing here, there hasn't been any extremely low mm. areas here. These, these signals are quite big all the time here in the voltage map. Also, not, really also scar the, this is not, not, not something like really, really scarce. What is your upper limit? This is 1.5 now. Yeah, if you decrease to 0 0.5. Yeah, we can put it in 0.5 to 0 0.5 now. Then it's even even more purple <laughs> there. That. Mm. Now it's one, if you turn one, around. 1 to 0.5. Everything is purple. Yeah, so anyway, when I have so many tachycardias, I would always go to the pulmonary venous atrium. To yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay, it's not it again, and this is just a cycle length now. It's even 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 slower than this. this might be might be the second one, or this might be a third one now. Seems to be that it's it looks a little bit different. It, it seems to be longer mm -hmm. longer cycle length now, or is it the same? And and again a little bit as, the first one. As, so, as a moderator, I need to yeah. comment on a few things related to stereotaxis. So despite this frustration, you can see Peko sitting there in a very relaxed mood <laughs> and doing the procedure. So it may be that we'll have to call it, was it this one? Mm Uh, Pekka, there is a comment from Anders that yes. he would definitely go for completing the line of double potentials yeah. to IVC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, I'm not com completely sure that how much how much do we have there because it seems to be that there's at least there's a delay here. You can see that it, it's it's really delaying in this line there. But I think that's that's something that we can we can do there that try to find. Oh, now it's switched. Is it, is it still the same? This is now the slower one. <laughs> uh, oh, it's still, it's still no, the same. It's still fast. It's still the fast uh -huh. one. Okay, let's, let's try to map now those to the double potentials here, what we can see here. Hopefully, hopefully we'll find something. And now we still see the... Might be nice to have something which is really fragmented in this area here. This is getting now almost like the pivot point again. It's getting very short distance between these potentials. Not yet in the IVC. Getting closer to the IVC. 
now we have a extremely small small signals here so it may be that we're getting getting so somewhere here we are getting getting the ivc Hmm. It's always, always nice, nice double bullets. Let's go to the other side. Is it, is it really delaying or not? No, I'm stuck. So it's in the middle there on the other side of the line and to go to the other side of the line. Line of the double potential, I mean. Um, Not so much difference. Again, a comment from Anders. Uh, what's about um, trying some entrainment? Yeah, like we can do it. I'll just take a couple more points in the area here. I think in this case, and uh, I am a really fan of entrainment. I really think that's uh, that's the most important part in this process. Yeah. In, the, in this particular case, I think the chance is very high that it will uh, convert the um, tachycardia to another one. But anyway, it, it's happening all the time, so we will not lose anything. Really. Okay, we have a quite nice, nice atria here on the top top of the double potential. We can try to pace here. The cycle length is now a little bit different again. This is 280, 300 milliseconds. We used to have it at close to 200 there. So it may be that we have a different tachycardia, but we can see what, what is the point PPI here. Hanu will patient. Okay. All right, now we start pacing for the ablation catheter. And so 70 milliseconds now it seems to be cap capturing the it's not so bad looks like that we have no is it is it capturing no. this, is, this is a little bit strange here oh 290 oh. okay let's look like that it was captured but no capture no. now it's capturing <clears throat> That's the V, and uh, this, this is this is quite nice here. Three hundred milliseconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. This is this is getting this is getting quite interesting here. Yeah, yeah. Now we're getting getting some some fragmentation, quite long potentials here. So it seems to be that the PPI was quite nice. We can try try to face it a little bit lower also. That's quite nice, nice potential here. Okay, let's try to try from here. Yeah, now lower. So if, it, if it's going around this this area, like this, we should get a nice PPI here also. Mm. Was it captured? Um, no, no. Big signals. Hopefully, we can capture. No, oh, no, now no. it's capturing. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's long. <laughs> now it's now it's extremely long. And I must say, it's not particularly pathological signal over there. It's uh, no, no. Even if it's part, you'll of have to have a have a nice, nice signal to be able to capture there. But here we had it a nice PPI. There it was a little bit bad. In the meantime, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Pete, who just joined us. Okay. He's the operator in the afternoon in Europe and in the morning in 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 the States. And I start to worry <laughs> about his sleeping. <laughs> Pete, any comments about it? Will you be fresh? Oh, hi. Good morning. Yes, I was able to to just get on. Or good afternoon for you. I think we will capture it. So it's long here. It may be that we were accidentally getting getting something something in this area. It seems to be quite long PPIs close to the close to the double potential line there let's let's go back here 
because I think that we had it the best test DPI here. Okay, you can try again. Ah. Okay, we got back. <laughs> so this this was a quite interesting area here. This this was the area that we really had it something something that it, it's it's really long. It's almost this is this is already long, but it seems to be that there's something something going on. Let's check that. What does it look like during the sinus rhythm there? It's a nice nice double potential here during the sinus. And now it's, it's when it's getting there. This is, this is really fragmented. I think that this 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 may be really having something to do with the with the arrhythmia here. Mm. This is this is something I would like to like to homogenize, like Thomas was telling there. But is it is it enough to take, do it only only here? I'm not so positive. Mm. So we were not able to make make sure that we really have a reentry going going around here. Otherwise, this is, this is not so nice. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas, I didn't hear you. No, I just said, but if you do it, we'll definitely not hurt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perhaps we can try to induce the tachycardia, and then we can try to try to ablate mm -hmm. here. It? Because it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's always nice to get get some some feedback there. That if we can get that faster tachycardia, we can we can try to try to what what is it? Is it a cap in the line, double potential line in, in this area there? Completely agree. I, I do the same always. Okay. All right, let's, let's try to induce it. it, and I'm close to that area now. Ah. Oh, we got it the first tachycardia. <laughs> <laughs> a, so I didn't mean that. We have a nice, nice double potential here. Also, this is this is the other tachycardia. This was this the first, not yeah. in the beginning. No, it's stopped. Okay, that, that's not stable. Let's there, be careful. Hanno is a little bit bad with this pacing. He doesn't know which tachycardia has to be induced. Uh, <laughs> Inducing the wrong one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to induce the right one. Yeah, quite high here. Usually, usually what I'm I'm always doing is that if I have a, something might be going around around the atriotomic scar here, I, I try to connect to the IVC, not not to go for the SVC. So usually, I don't know. For example, here if we go go for the SVC, connecting the line there, and perhaps we have already some some at least delay here in this area. That do we do we really get the sinus rhythm? Still working there, you might may get the sinus sinus to the other side of the line completely there. But usually, usually I'm always always connecting the scar, even in the patient with ASD, it's, it's the usual way always connect to the IVC, not to the SVC, even even you have a short distance to both ways there. Mm Seems to be that we have a mechanical block here. <laughs> Can't yeah. use anything. Uh, how much emi how much amiodarone ha have you given? <laughs> no amiodarone. <laughs> yeah, that's that's usually also the problem that if you have already fully loaded the patient with amiodarone, it takes so long long time to wash it out. But he's he's not been taking amiodarone, luckily. No, I was just teasing you. And there is one more thing. If you 
anytime if you fear during the procedure that it's a very um uh, let's say neutral part uh, like too long induction or um, preferably a success after a successful ablation a waiting time or something we can always um uh, we can always show some movies so please feel uh, free um to tell us okay if, if you want want to show some some other information i think this might be nice nice Minus i has try to induce it a little bit if we can get it induced and if we have some some fragmentation during the tachycard we we'll, we'll perhaps try to ablate in this area and check check towards to the inferior vena cave from here here but please feel feel that because it's yeah, because the the induction of course is not on. that interesting and once you can in, induce or you are going to ablate yeah, it, i will tell you when we can come back yeah, Tomas and Pekka, this is Pete. Yeah, thanks also. And could you just describe a little bit, each of you, from both your experience, just the, the unique difference in doing these type of cases overall, manually versus robotically? And we were manage? Yeah, we were discussing that earlier. Earlier, Tomas yeah. was asking, do you want to do it yeah, manually? We, we no. it right yeah, maybe really some North America just joining you. Yeah. It's possible to do it, but it, it, I really hate to do it manually. I, I always prefer to do it with the magnets. It, it's so nice. You can sit down here. I didn't take these leads away. I forgot it. <laughs> but yeah. usually it's so nice, nice that you can relax and you can do the cases and you can do the PPIs. But we discussed also in the beginning that this is usually the setup that when we have a difficult cases like VP cases that we are doing it like this. That Hanu is, uh, I don't, I, I don't, is sitting and doing the pacing and trying to induce the tachycardia. For example, for the VP cases, this is this is really nice way that. The other one can move the catheter fastly and try to find during the hemodynamic instable VT, find find the diastolic potential ablate there. You have always always something like half a minute, minute or couple minutes that you can do the mapping there. So it, it works nicely. Straight answer to your question that if I have the choice, always magnetics for these kind of cases. Yes, same here, Pete. Um, I I don't I just simply don't do it. So. Even when uh, we didn't have access in Erasmus for uh, three years, we, I took personally the patients to Amsterdam when, uh, where there's another system. And we treated the uh, uh, patients over there with, um, with Mukti Arkan, uh, another physician. Um, and I, I simply don't want to do it uh, anymore manually. Um, having said this, I did this as well back to uh, Budapest. And for instance, without defo puncture, um, you may access the pulmonary venous, venous atrium, but um, making a complete map is all, almost impossible. Lucky enough, if it's an um, isthmus dependent, um, it's a cave tricuspid isthmus dependent flutter, in these cases, when part of the tissue is in the systemic venous and then other part in the pulmonary venous atrium, is that part you, you can reach so actually it's possible to ablate and it's still the most common arrhythmia in those cases as well um but um i mean with this system you can map very easily all of the pulmonary veins and, and everything so no way that i will do it uh, manual anymore Okay, we got it attacking cardio now. It seems to be that they had something going on with the 300 milliseconds. This is, this is close to that one, so close to that one. So it's the, the fast one, but this is, this is the area what we had it nice, 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 really, really fragmented thing out there. And best PP I was here, here, but it was a little bit worse. But we, we decided now that we will, we will give a show, short, short ablation here and see do we get any, anything there. And, like Anders was telling in the beginning, perhaps we'll try to eliminate this, this line of double potential completely there, but I will start with this bot here. There's a nice, nice, nice long, long signal here. We all very we have, excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that we will get something going on in this, this area here, but Usually when you have a fragmented signal like that, and if you are really in the gap, it, it stops almost immediately here. So we don't get any, any response here, but it's, it's a funny to look at this signal look, look for the double potentials. It's getting wide here and there's no fragmentation anymore. 
so something is still really happening in this area but what what does it do when we had it this this fragmented signal in the beginning of the ablation let's go for the beginning of the ablation but the activation uh sequences this is the same. yeah yeah it was in the beginning from the beginning it, it wasn't the same yeah so this may be so the third is, one yeah this this looks like a, this is cs yeah. is activating differently than in the beginning the, 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 Hannu was telling that this is the third tachycardia and i agree that this is this is not the same same what we had it there it was different this is this is clearly distal to proximal here mm. It would be really need to see see a stable tachycardia. We would really have an idea that is it is it going to be in this area or do we have to go for the other one? Most likely we'll have to go for the other side also. Let's let's try to do a little bit. Hopefully we can get some some points here. I, I think he, he, eventually you for sure should because if you have so many tachycardias, even the likelihood statistically that none of them from the pulmonary vein is atrium is almost zero. That's right here. Yeah. Pekka, in the meantime, uh, there was a question from the audience, and this is a, a very important point, by the way, in all stereotaxis procedures, even if it's not related completely to the case, but um, can you explain your power and irrigation settings? Yeah, I mean, usually we usually have the irrigation is the same as, as usually starting with the 17. If you have an increase in the, in the temperature, we will increase the, increase the power. Our, our, <laughs> experience is that you'll have to have something like 10 watts more so if i'm ablating manually with 30 watts i will start with 40 watts if i ablate 30 i start with 40 watts so i always always have a little bit more power power when doing doing these cases i know that you've been using in, in rotterdam for if ablation 50 watts or something like that usually we have 35 40 watts what's in the, in the atria fibrillation ablation in these cases the minimum is usually 40 watts when we start these Usually, when you have the scarring area operate with hard set, you can get the get effect a little bit lower, but always have to have more power than with manual ablations. So something like atrial fibrillation, something like 30 watts is the minimum below that we never never go go. And usually, when we're doing VT cases, we are using 50 watts. And then we are looking also the temperature. If it's getting higher, we will try to try to increase the flow. And if it's not working, that's that's the last thing. Then we will go and reduce the power. But I think the important issue is that we really have to have the power. I think in the beginning it was the bad point, which which made made us fooled in many 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 places. The stereotaxis was telling us that you have so stable catheter conductor that less power is enough. But I don't believe in that. I think that we'll have to have more power with the stereotaxis than with manual manual ablation always. Yeah, I can only agree with it. And I think we yeah. proved all of us in the last 10 years that that's the case. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree completely. And for AFib, we will commonly even use 50 watts on the anterior aspects and with, yeah. uh, you know, posterior aspects, 35, 35 watts. In the US, we, uh, you know, for above uh, 30 watts, we end up having irrigation at, at 30 actually, as well for this catheter, just from the IFU and how things are set up uh, in the US. Uh, in the ventricle also, uh, 50 always. I think you do have consistent, stable focal contact, but you also, you do not have, you know, 30 grams of contact force, right? So I, I, I agree that uh, a little higher is important. I would also say that in spite of that, it's exceptionally rare to have a steam pop. You know, have you guys had much experience where you end up having a steam pop with this catheter? I think it's exceptionally rare actually uh, in comparison to a manual catheter in spite of using higher uh, energy. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Agree. It's, 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 it's quite rare, but I still still you'll have to watch a little bit what what's happening with your temperature there. If temperature is getting higher, you have to stop ablating there. I think usually usually the temperature is getting higher before you can see the increase in the impedance there. So we're always looking looking, and our our goal is that always the temperature is below forty. If it starts with forty, you have to do something. 
something. And I think that's that's one of the reasons that if you are in a bounce there, that irrigation is not working, that we don't have late there, then we don't get get the steam pops. But do you remember when you have the steam pop with the stereo that is scattered? It, 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 I, I've never had it. Yeah, it, it's extremely rare. Like, right, like, I would say almost that, never. I never remember that. No, I, well. I, I really have to think that <laughs> yeah. it may be that there has been something. When we occasionally do the <clears> typical <throat> flooders after acre fibrillation, ablation, then go for 50, 55 watts there, <clears> try, to, try to ablate. I think that it may be that I have had some, something there, but mm. I don't remember mm. for sure. No, I agree with a with a temperature control set at 40 degrees or 42 degrees and automatic shutoff that it's exceptionally safe in that way. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a very important. So um, I agree. I saw a few times in my life a uh, steam pop with stereotaxis catheter. And um, all of them were then um, at the time when we had the maximum temperature set to uh, 47. And now we have 43 and um, never saw it. Okay, it started again. Is it the same? Mm. No. no. Sequence is the same. Yeah, now we have the same sequence. <laughs> 340 milliseconds now. So what's next, Pekka? I think we'll have to have to go for the pulmonary atria. Let, let's we will try to do the puncture first, and if it if it seems to be some some problems with that, we can do do a little bit retrograde mapping there. But I think that we will have to go for the other side and try to try to find if we have a better better substrate there. It was looking like a little bit that there might be something something going here, but we don't get the cycle length. This is this is only 180 milliseconds mm -hmm. here, so. I think the next step is that we will we will go for the pulmonary atrium, try to do the buffer puncture now. And we can we can we can take take a pause now that if you want to show some some videos, we will prepare the patient for doing the puncture and we can show it. So yeah, it also the we puncture, I think we we all want to see and until you prepare we show some movies. Yeah, if yeah. Marlos is um... and everything is going to be safe there that it is it's, but let's 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 do that and Try to try to get it there, and you can some share the movies with the people now. We will we will continue from that. Come back when we get get something going on. There's always something that can last night. Introducing Genesis RMN, Stereotaxis' latest innovation in robotic intervention. Genesis is a leap forward in robotic technology and represents the future of electrophysiology. With redesigned magnets and a novel mechanism of action, patients, physicians, and hospitals can benefit from the differentiated benefits of robotic magnetic navigation in an architecture that is now smaller, lighter, faster, and more flexible. Included with Genesis is an advanced proprietary X-ray system specifically designed for electrophysiology. Stereotaxis Imaging Model S incorporates modern flat panel detector technology to reduce radiation and provide clear image quality. It is designed to be robust and reliable and includes a broad range of features including beam collimation, adjustable frame rates, a variable SID and more. The Genesis RMN system utilizes smaller magnets that rotate along their center of mass. This allows for unprecedented responsiveness to the physician's control. Across a broad range of navigational routines, the Genesis system is 70 to 80 percent faster than Niobe. The entire system is significantly smaller and designed to improve the patient and lab experience with greater access to the patient during the procedure. The full suite Genesis RMN system provides the most advanced capabilities in robotic magnetic navigation in a more accessible and affordable package. Visit our website at stereotaxis.com to learn how the Genesis RMN system can drive patient care and practice growth at your hospital.
So, uh, Pete, are you still here? Uh, yes, I am. Um, uh, one of the thing, one of the slide was uh, the Society of Cardiac Robotic Navigation, and um, I explained uh, during my introduction speech uh, what is this society. I also explained that um, I founded it very long time ago, and uh, maybe you can say also a few words about our um, aims and um, also maybe um, to motivate people to become a member of this society as a. I, I, I suppose it's not a secret that you are an upcoming president, right? <laughs> no, no, I think that's just, that's just great. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, you know, I think that it's seen a, a very successful growth uh, in, over the past you know five years or so with now a great series of successful international conferences that have been held uh, every year, of course, except for except for this year with the um, the pandemic. Uh, and of course, that now then triggering this opportunity to do these uh, sort of uh, masterclass type demonstrations, of course, the first one being the incredible uh, day that we spent with you uh, showing the efficiency uh, of your of your ability to treat patients with atrial fibrillation and uh, and you know these these cases today uh, highlighting Genesis and we hope moving forward. But more importantly, the society really is meant to be more of an open uh, discussion forum uh, for providing, uh, communi communication, uh, member interaction, uh, education, uh, and not just between uh, physicians, but also interested uh, uh, members of the scientific community, uh, engineers, uh, different participants uh, as well from industry, uh, and and really providing a forum for having moving the for dis the discussion forward uh, as far as the use of uh, automation and robotics in electrophysiology. Um, and I think that over time, we will hopefully have accelerating uh, growth uh, that will be exponential as now we begin to uh, see more and more associated technologies come forward. Um, it's meant not to be entirely focused just on the one technology. Of course, uh, Stereotaxis is uh, the, the most heavily used and with the most experience around the world and has provided a tremendous amount of support, but so have many other uh, of our corporate sponsors, including the, the mapping companies, uh, uh, companies involved with advanced uh, image integration, uh, at, uh, different robotic uh, companies as well. Uh, and so we look forward to interacting uh, with all of those uh, parts, uh, members of the community, so to speak, uh, that are moving forward with robotics and automation at NEP. I think many of us feel that it's far past the time uh, where we really establish this type of technology in our area of work uh, that, uh, that work in electrophysiology and cardiology in general has been uh, behind a lot of other areas in medicine. You know, if, uh, if we needed to have in the US anyway, have maybe a laparoscopic or prostate surgery or something like this, now there's a high percentage chance that you'd be operated on uh, utilizing a robotic system. Um, and I think that, of course, the work we do is very complicated uh, and comfort level with changing technologies and the associated uh, costs, et cetera, that, that need to be managed. All this is starting to come together now in a way that it never could a decade ago uh, and makes a, a, a truly exciting era now in moving forward with these types of technologies. So uh, we invite everybody to the conversation and uh, we think now is an incredible time uh, to join in to that conversation and help move it forward. I think as a physicians too, this is our opportunity to have a voice with the technology companies and with the other associated uh, uh, members of the society uh, to help shape what that future will look like as well. So uh, that I would strongly encourage everybody to start getting involved. Yeah, great words, Pete. And maybe you can say also a few more words about the telerobotic part of this uh, uh, possibilities because it goes a bit parallel with it, and it's not necessary um, only robotics. But on the on the other hand, um, it really shows the the possibilities uh, of the innovation in that field as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, there's uh, the way I've started thinking about it now is that there's sort of three different aspects to telemedicine that are applicable uh, in the way that we work. Um, 
you know, they would, they would include uh, telerobotic uh, support, which is where we uh, receive the support of our uh, technology partners and our vendors uh, in our labs uh, more remotely. Uh, you know, this is already in place uh, very clearly from some of the major companies, in, uh, including Steratexas, where, for instance, if you are having a problem during your case with, say, software in your uh, Odyssey or something like this, they are able from St. Louis to interact with you and provide remote support that way, um, uh, you know, to fix what's going on, for instance, from afar and to help provide that type of support. I think that will continue to grow, uh, not just in, uh, you know, doing robotic ablation procedures, but for instance, even our device procedures in this, you know, is it necessarily the case that you have to have your device representative physically there, you know, should we be able instead to be able to make use of, of our support from afar? Um, you know, uh, so one is telerobotic support. The other is telerobotic peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, interaction that still is short of actually doing telerobotic surgery, but, you know, how can we get involved uh, with working with each other uh, across, you know, without the barriers of time and distance? Um, you know, can I bring up your uh, Odyssey screen, for instance, and, and point out something in your uh, procedure that might be of interest or provide guidance, uh, or if one of your, uh, you know, friends from a, another country is learning a new technique or new technology, can you uh, reach into their lab to help provide guidance without actually manipulating uh, anything on the patient, uh, you know, just to, it, yes, ju just the aspect of telerobotics peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support and education. I think will be key, uh, similarly for for training fellows, et cetera. You know, and again, we're we're moving toward that, uh, but you really need to have all the pieces put together to do that. It's not just enough to see what's going on in someone else's lab. I think it's it, it's going to be important to be able to reach into their to their lab and manipulate the the data streams, uh, and you know, for instance, be able to scroll through their uh, recording system to point out certain electrograms or to rotate around a map or something and point at something. You know, I think there's a lot that could be already done that way uh, okay. that we should expand on. And then third stage and final but stage would be second, actually uh, telerobotic uh, surgery, we, right? We, yes. One second, we will come back to this. Don't forget yes, yes, yes. what you wanted to say, but I got the message that uh, Helsinki is ready to show oh, oh, Yes, we want to see what they're doing, please. Absolutely. So, but we will come back to the third point. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Helsinki, we are here also again line. Hear me now. Online. Okay, are we online? Yes, we are. So we made, made a puff of puncture here. I hope that I find the correct position here in the in the screen here. I was scrolling down down from the cinema system here. We have the seat. I put it the seat here in the right atrium. Now still the ablation cadet, it was almost in the same position as we want to get to get the seat. So we will be pulling pulling the ablation cadet away. And the seat is here. I will take it a little bit higher, and then I put the dilator there. So now, now you can't nicely get to the SBC here to do any any puncture. So we'll put the put the dilator seat here, and this is very anterior. The arrow in the needle is pointing up, so you do the puncture very very anteriorly. So it's it's pointing up there. It was a little bit tricky. Let's. So now it looks quite nicely there, but it didn't really stuck there. I was manipulating a little bit, gave a little bit contrast there. Now you can see that I'm trying to get it stuck to the septum there. Now it's still slipping away. Finally, I got it, got it somewhere here that it was nice, nicely stable there. I gave once, once a contrast there. Didn't, didn't really go through. I, we can perhaps go. I don't remember now that how much we have here. If we can go, you enlarge, uh, or you can't enlarge anymore this one? Pardon? The X-ray. X-ray is this this now. I can't. It's in the cinema system. This is recorded here. Oh. Okay. I can't do it anymore. So we are usually having the AP and. What we are doing is that we have the right atrium map. I'll put the ablation cadet in a position that this is this might be the puncture site. Then it's it's nice with the flora that you will go anterior to the same site there. And when it's AP here, you should be coming coming through from here. Now it's getting getting a little bit better there. Still slipping away. I manipulate a little bit more. Let's go 30 seconds more. Uh, it may be that it was okay. Now 
let's go back. It seems to be that I'm already in the left side. Why is it not starting? Oh, we can see that if it's still going on, we'll do a little bit changing there. So needle completely anterior there. Now we have already did the puncture there. I put the wire there. This was not so stiff there, that, but usually we are having the dilator in, then we put the kite wire in. It may be sometimes you get it to the pulmonary vein, not here. So we get it the kite wire here and on the top of the kite wire, we get it a sheet inside the pulmonary atria here. It's getting getting there. Then pulling pulling the dilator and the sheet away. Also it's still there. Didn't feel so long when we were doing it, but looking at it later on, it seems to be so long time. <laughs> okay, now I think that the dilator is nicely there and the sheet is now there. Pekka, this is this is Pete. For those of us less experienced in doing congenital work like this, can you uh, discuss? Obviously, your your significant experience in doing this makes you very comfortable. But many of us would also use intracardiac echo to help us visualize. You know what? Uh, how we're how we're dealing with this? Can you comment on, on that a bit? That we under left eight, we are there. We were sucking this. Now it seems to be that the patient patient had some some visual disturbance there that we'll have to check that what's going on there that we were careful with the sheets there that there shouldn't be any any error or anything like that but something something is there i have to discuss with the patient let's see yeah i i i, I also wanted to ask that feed because we have the of you So anyway, it's time maybe then you can, until Pekka comes back to, to finish your third point. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, so the third point was a discussion, you know, we talked about telerobotic support, then telerobotic peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction. Uh, and the third and, and final stage, of course, would be true telerobotic surgery, where you might reach into your friend's lab and not just help with pointing things out, but actually manipulate a, a catheter or manipulate a surgical tool in the other lab. Uh, from afar. And of course, we've demonstrated the capability of doing this many, many times, you know, even starting more than a decade ago with the original uh, procedure done remotely uh, by Dr. Papone, uh, you know, from the podium in Boston, right, on, on the patient in Milan. Uh, and of course, more recently, the great procedures that were shared between, uh, you know, Milan and, uh, uh, and uh, Lisbon. Uh, and some some others as well. So you know, I think that they're especially don't in, don't forget mine. Don't and forget yours as well. Of course, you, uh, exactly, exactly. During SCRN, of course, you did the cases as well uh, from the podium uh, back to uh, patients in your lab as well. And so I think the the point there, honestly, is that it's not the technology that's the limiting factor uh, at this point. Uh, we actually have had and continue to expand the technological capability of very effectively doing remote uh, procedures. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it instead, especially in the States, has to do with regulatory, legal framework, et cetera, um, where, you know, what would it mean uh, to be able to actually operate on somebody remotely as far as, uh, you know, licensure, uh, hospital credentialing, uh, patient consent, uh, all of these things, right? And so I think that, uh, you know, in, in the big picture, what we need to do is focus on the fact that the rare uh, commodity, the, the thing that we need to be able to share is not so much the technology itself, but instead the expertise, right? The experts, right? What's, what is the benefit of having uh, Tomash be able to help out uh, with your, or, or have Pekka be able to actually come into my lab and help me out with a complex congenital uh, procedure, right? I think that that would be a tremendous benefit to our patients. Um, you know, and I think we still need to continue to work on the framework of how that's going to look. So I think, and that will be different, you know, depending on where you are throughout the world, what are the, what are the legal challenges, what are the you know, ethical, legal, and those, those uh, conversations to have beyond the technology. But I really think the technology is actually there or pretty darn close to, to being there. So I don't know what your, your thoughts are as well and, and what that looks like. You know, do you see a place 
as opposed to just being a demonstration thing or something to do at meetings, is there a place for it yet in actual clinical practice or how far away are we from achieving that? Yeah, absolutely. You are completely right. And um, I can only agree with that. And um, beyond the legal issues, which of course can be solved, um, um, it's sometimes always a threshold in us to contact each other, which, um, which is also an, an important issue. And we have to develop another culture to have a lower threshold to contact each other in those cases. Well, and I think that is the advantage of the SCRN, right? If we have a community of users of robotics, but also those who are interested in having those discussions, uh, then we begin to create the necessary community for successfully doing this, right? You'd, you'd like ultimately, of course, to have a network of users and uh, specialists and operators uh, who would be able to help each other out, right? And to be able to help patients out in various locations. Um, there's also, of course, the question of providing service in underserved areas, right? You know, yeah, what would it mean to potentially deliver some type of robotic system uh, to an un underserved area and have somebody locally, for instance, be able to place access and place a catheter and have an expert operator uh, work with that patient from a remote location? You know, what would that look like in changing your practice model, uh, et cetera? So, you know, I think that there's a lot of discussion, but I think the future will, will look like that in lots of ways. And again, that's the importance of the SRN to provide a forum for discussions like that. Yeah, excellent. So back to Helsinki, I see that uh, PECA is already mapping, so we can give the word back. Yeah, is it, is it online now? So we started mapping now. Jason had it, had it some some visual disturbance. He, he was telling that it, it's it's migraine, same same kind of what he's having having for a migraine attacks in the past. So we gave some some medication and hopefully hopefully it will resolve easily. So now we at the pulmonary atria. We'll we'll do a little bit mapping here. It seems to be that we got it for a while at least. It was the slower tachycardia going on. It seems to be that the CS catheter has moved. By the way, now. Is it still? Yeah, Hannu can adjust the CS a little bit because yeah. we can't have a stable reference anymore. During the puncture, we lost lost the nice position of the CS catheter. It seems to be that these points are not so nicely nicely taken there because of the. Hey, Pekka, we actually asked. Uh, about the use of intracardiac echo. Uh, you know, I see that uh, you, you're so exceptionally comfortable in doing this kind of work uh, without, for many of us who are less experienced in doing congenital work. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. We were also, also having some, some discussions. Usually, usually we don't do the, do the intracardiac echo in these cases. If we want to do something, we will, we will take a PE probe, and now we are using the nasal PE probe for these, these but it, it's we want to, it, it's nice when you have done the right atrial map, then you can nicely see that you have to puncture. And it, it's feeling that it doesn't really, really give so much additional information for us. But if you are familiar with the ice catheters and things like that, I think it, it's a good way to do, use it, use it, and it, it's valuable information there. But we pre prefer instead of ice, we prefer to use and like we discussed earlier, we have had access for nice, nice thin PE probe, which can be put on via the nose of the patient there, and it gives, gives excellent views there. And it's cost effective also that you don't, it's not a single use catheter, it, it helps a lot. And the patient feels comfortable without anesthesia. Doing, we are usually doing these cases without any anesthesia. We feel that it, it's, it's usually conscious sedation is in, in these cases enough. Can you tell me more about that nasal TE probe? Is it is it a specific probe, the nasal TE, or do you use? A, yeah, we have it. I don't know. I think that the other other system we have it for the, our Philips echo machines. That it, it's it's a thin probe. You can put it. It's so thin that you can put it via the nose. So smaller than the eight French ice that we have used before. I think it may be maybe a little bit thicker than that. The ice catheter there, but. Have you been using the ice? Well, it's smaller than regular TE. Yeah, like a pediatric. Yeah, much, much smaller. Probe. Much, yeah. much smaller. So the patient doesn't feel bad there that when the probe is on, you can do easily the puncture there. 
it's perhaps not not good tool to use it there for extremely long procedures and let it beat there we've been doing it the other colleagues are doing like like pfo closures ast closures and left atrial appendix closures and even even use it partially also for the cases that they're doing mitoclips and things like that because it's it's we have a limited access for anesthesia in the hospital so we have to find the solutions that we can which can be done without general anesthesia and if you have a conventional te probe inside the inside the esophagus it's it's so difficult for the patient that they don't really feel feel well and can't really do the case okay now i'll do an other other remap here because we got it uh, CS reference better now, so we can do a little bit mapping. But now it's back to sinus again. <laughs> Did it clarify a little bit? I think that it's 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 valuable information that don't don't hesitate to use if you have nice nice access and you're familiar with the ice catheters or or do the cases in general anesthesia. It, it's it's a nice way to do it using using the and nasal T is a nice solution. You can do it without general anesthesia also. Yes, I've not seen the nasal TE before. I think that's a great idea. That's super interesting. We'll have to look into yeah. Just yeah. About that. Yeah, you so, have to yeah, I think the probe is something like 20,000 euros, but it, it's you can just clean it like a normal TE probe and get it, get it back to the lab and you can use it forever. Uh, Pekka, anything about the strategy right now? Patient is back in the sinus rhythm, so I, I try to get a little bit anatomical view here, a little bit better feeling of the anatomy. Then we start to induce it again, and hopefully we can get something something nicely going on. And I, I've been doing the mapping and try to find also that if I have some some fragmented signals, I mark those. At the same time, we have something like here. We have the double potential area area there's tiny tiny but double potential so we can mark those those during during but first we will try to get get some some anatomy here and then try to induce because i feel that it's better that you have the anatomical information already available and then it's faster to do the mapping of the tachycardia if i'm now inducing the tachycardia try to do the anatomy at the same time it may be a little bit tricky here's a nice double potential also also in this area so hopefully we'll get get some some information here Oh, it didn't change that. Oh. Yeah. Actually, why? Why doesn't it change? Want to put it location only, <laughs> so it's affecting the anatomy, but <clears throat> not the activation sequence. So this is getting getting nicely around the atria there we didn't check the position of the seat there it may be that we'll have to adjust it a little bit but seems to be that we'll get a nice nice map of the atria it's starting to look like left atrium you can see from the navigation screen there that i was already already there in the ventricle area that what was nice nice ventricle potentials there a little bit tricky, it's stucking a little bit here. Now this is some, some structure that it's, it's stuck there. Try to pull it back and release the catheter a little bit more. Okay. Then we'll try to mark the annulus area also. Also here, oh shit, it's going to the same spot all the time. And this is our typical typical mapping setup there that I'm using the cardio drive with this keyboard, turning the vector with this mouse, and then taking the voice with my, my foot. So I'm calling this four field drive and it works nicely. You don't have to go click this or anything else, click here to take the points, just use the foot pedal and get the points with it. But there is a big disadvantage of it, Pekka. Pardon? There is a big disadvantage of this. What is that? 
You can't drink a coffee. <laughs> I want to treat the patients, not to drink coffee. <laughs> but you can't take the points with the keyboard. You still need your hands for that. And you're losing your cup, coffee cup there, and if it's, you're dropping your coffee cup on the top of the keyboard, that's not so nice. That's that's the thing you should always avoid. No coffee, no coke on the keyboard. That's also a good point. Yeah, in this, this procedure, it's an important point. Not so important <clears throat> when you're sterile there using using the manual catheters. I think we got it nicely, nicely to the pulmonary vein. We can see nicely here that. Yeah, nicely, nicely inside the pulmonary vein. There's no spikes, no no activity here. Pulling it back now, then then we try to get a little bit more information in this area, then a little bit more to the lower part of the atrium here. All right. Usually when we get get the catheter and see it in a relaxed position, it, it's quite easy to map it. Now I got it nicely there, that there was some, some area that I was stuck, that now it's quite simple that I don't even have to use the cardio drive at all. I just do the vector and I get a nice nice map of the atria completely going, going just around everything here. Okay, perhaps you know, I moved a little bit. It was just getting to the annulus area then. Perhaps we'll start marking a little bit. So here I would like to make a remark because um, of course it's an, um, it, it's going to be a very beautiful map and um, the only ones can see uh, the difference who already perform this also manually. And this is a really huge difference. I mean, it looks now easy, but believe me, it's um, it's manually, uh, even with baffle puncture can be more difficult in these atria. And without baffle puncture, um, I think it's close to impossible to do, uh, to perform such a map uh, um, uh, manually. And uh, I can tell you, I can create the same kind of map very easily um, doing a retrograde uh, mapping. Yeah, with the manga. Having yeah. said this, it's difficult to enter the atrium, but once you are in the atrium um, from the right ventri ventricle, then it, it's going to be quite easy, actually. And the same like what you see from um, Pekka right now. Mm. Okay. So I think we have the first, first tachycardia, what we had it in the beginning, the slow one now, it, it's, it's going, going here. Okay, let's try to get it, get, it, get the ventricle area somewhere here. This is already quite deep in the ventricle there. So nice ventricle signal there. I think we can take these these points here. That this is this is getting to the annulus. There we have a. Is it a retrograde or undergrade? Most, most likely, after after seeing what what's going on, that it's a undergradely conducting P wave just after the atrial signal just after the QRS complex. Okay, now it came more to the atria. Perhaps a little bit more in the annulus, and then we can try to induce the tachycardia. Still, it goes to the atria. The other part of the annulus, it, it should be a little bit better here. Maybe in the annulus, we don't see any. Any other questions from audience, panelists? I wonder if you could comment on your choice of use of sheath. And, you know, once you've been across the baffle, do you pull the sheath back a little bit to give more maneuverability or leave the sheath fairly far across uh, the baffle? Yeah, we, for ability? Yeah. Uh, what type of sheath do you choose? It's it just an SL, SL1 sheath. Usually with the magnets, it, it's, it's easy, to, easy to manipulate to get it. Uh, we pull it a little bit back, back, try to get them. That's why I was using the contrast there that we can see that it's not, not too, too much inside and uh, close, close to the top there. Then you're gonna 
have problems manually to get it through there. You know, in manual cases, where sometimes if, if you have to really do it manually, we sometimes taking taking a steerable sheet also makes it a little bit easier. But usually with this magnet catheter that I don't want to pull it too much because I don't want to lose the access there. That, that's that's the problem. That this is not so simple to get it back as as with the transeptal puncture conventionally for AFib cases, for example. It's it's much easier to get it back. Usually you can get it back with the catheter, but here here you usually have to take everything from the beginning. So I want to keep it keep it a little bit in the safe area, let's put it that way. There's some, some area here that... As you're making the anatomy, it also... Bit. I was gonna say, as you're making the anatomy, it also reminds me that for all left atrial work, including just garden variety atrial fibrillation, and I know Thomas and Tomas can speak to this a lot too, is that the, just the quality of the anatomy is outstanding, right? You're not. You're not deforming the anatomy with a stiff catheter. You're not pushing out. You don't need to then go back and re-edit the anatomy to get rid of uh, artificial space. And that the uh, yeah. the beauty of being able to map with the same catheter that you're going to use to ablate means that if you're able to get into that location to do mapping and get into contact with the tissue, then you're going to be able to do the same while you're ablating, right? As That's opposed right. to using yeah. different yeah. catheter. Yeah. And it's also when doing AFib ablations manually. I'm usually doing all the, all the maps with the ablation catheter because if you do it with the lasso catheter or pentare or something like that, it, it's quite common that you will dilate a little bit the ostial area there. And then when you try to get the ablation catheter, it doesn't reach there. And it, it's, it's easy that you start pushing it too much and then it's going to be risky. Risky. I like the idea that when you know that the ablation catheter has been there once, you will be able to get it there again. Okay, I think Hannu will get quite much of the atria. There's some, some areas there, but perhaps we can try to induce the tachycardia. Let's go a little bit more towards the annulus once, once more. One hole there. That's, that's, that's a big hole there. Hannu was telling that we still have a hole here. <laughs> that's, it. that's also, if it, oh, it moved. there was a nice, nice double potential also in this area there. What FEM resolution do you use here? I'm having 12. That's, that's usually usually what we are using. Occasionally we will go for six or something like that to get it a little bit faster. But if you want to get some, some information in the pulmonary vein or something like that, it, it's 12 is like a compromise that we quite commonly, commonly use. If we go, go a little bit lower, we can get now, now it's six, so we can start getting, getting the anatomy a little bit faster, faster, but then it's not so, so accurate in any all the positions there. But perhaps in this case that we need more information on the annulus and then we can. Yeah. Doing a left atrial map like this, do you feel that, that the uh, genesis is, can you sense the, how much smoother and, and faster the movement is compared with using the Niobe making a left atrial map? No, not really. I think that's that, very similar. All, 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 I was discussing this in the beginning there in, the, in my talk when you were not here that it, the first generation magnets were so slow that yeah. you, you were really, really getting getting bored with doing the cases there. But the last last generation, second generation magnets, they were you can't really feel in your ass that it, is, it, is it getting faster or not. Yeah, yeah. Although even just watching you here, enough, but it's so it, like like moving it is it seems to be that it, it moves immediately. Turning the vector here, it, it goes immediately. So it's one to one yes. reaction there that it goes nicely. Exactly. Okay. That's what I was gonna say. You can see as you're moving right now just how immediate it is. It's it's basically instant. Yeah, yeah. And so guys, I'm actually going to have to step off in a bit because I actually need to get ready and go to my hospital. So I will- well, I've uh, been waking up early, so. <laughs> Yeah, it was 4.30, 4.30 when I joined, yes. Sleep. No, no, we're good, yes, but uh, okay, no, I need to get up to my hospital. So take some, some we'll rejoin you, area, yeah, we'll rejoin you in a bit. Thank you so much, appreciate Great. it, thanks so much. See you, Pete, soon. Okay, I got it some, some attention points in the annulus area here. Perhaps we can now try to induce Induced the tachycardia. Yeah. It was some some short runs there. 
for a while, but it turned out that and now when we have have this, this is this is getting the annulus. Let's put an LAO to the other side here. All right. We need to get the line line. Let's let's see. Okay, try Which to do it. Tachycardia do we want? <laughs> get the fast one. <laughs> ah, the person in it. So now, um, uh, Pekka, uh, this is um, very nice, but uh, of course the nature of the master class is that people are logging in and logging out. So maybe uh, now we started almost two hours ago, more than two hours ago, maybe you can give a short summary what you did so far. Okay. And yeah. What you are going to do right now. Yeah. We started the case, case mapping, mapping the right atrium, I can show it. So it's here also that taking taking left left area away. This is on the cardo screen now on the other side, the right side that we did the did the right atrial map. We can see nicely that there's the SVC and IVC, and then we got the annulus points here. We were inducing you know, spontaneously starting and inducing several kinds of tachycardia, at least three different kind of tachycards. One was around 200, a little bit over 200 millisecond atrial cycle length. Yeah lowest one was like like 400 millisecond cycle length then there was something fluctuating at 300 a little bit over we find in the right side that we have have the atriotomy scar here this is a this is a long line of double potentials here this was a long long fragmented signal here in this area we did some entrainment in this area here it was quite nice ppi Going to the other side, that this the PPI was long, about 100 milliseconds longer there. It seems to be that it wasn't none of the tachycardias were mappable to this this area. There we did one ablation here on the fragmented signal. It didn't affect the tachycardia, but it's it's going and stopping there. So we decided that we to the buffer puncture go go to the pulmonary atria here. Now we've been mapping mapping the pulmonary atria. My catheter is now like you see see from here that it's a big V. Very small, small A that goes to the annulus there. So hopefully we'll get some, some little bit more stable tachycardia now and get a little bit idea what, what we can do do there. Is it, is it possible to ablate it safely, safely and nicely? More with that, and if you go. Thank you. Quite often, this is, this is now from the inferior view here that we are like like. Exactly in the pulmonary atria annulus here. Usually you have to go until you are reaching reaching the other side or annulus in the other side. Then if you have a tachycardia depending on the isthmus. But now it seems to be that we can't get any tachycardia going on. So we have had multiple tachycardias so far, and nothing has been really easy to map staying changes all the time the, quite commonly we have something that it, it's it's changing but we can have an idea we can map one tachycardia and we can get it get it done and then we can change for the other tachycardia but now it seems to be that everything is going on and going back and but not not extremely exceptional there that this can be happening let, let me change the basic is side. it now the okay yeah Look like that there was a, for a short while there was this low tachycard, but now it's in the sinus. <laughs> in the meantime, I just make a comment, um, uh, not particularly about this procedure, just for the audience that in those cases, I always make sure that I uh, take the his bundle uh, sometimes its location is very unpredictable of yeah course. i think we had it a nice i can take this if we had it a nice nice his potentials here in the oh yes. sorry sorry yeah. the right side yeah. and it's yeah. stacked there now we can there it is yeah it was stacked, stacking it multiple times there yeah. and you can get it also from the pulmonary venous yeah open. yeah it's possible there but it, there it is we put several attacks for the his. yeah yeah is this the last map? Oh, it is here in the other yeah. map. This, this is his area here. And my worst case is when um, somehow you have to ablate in that region. And that it occurs more than I thought in the past. And it's very frustrating. Yeah. 
Give me a break. Have you identified here a lot of scar tissue in this atrium? No, there was there, there, there we had some some double potentials here. You can see. See, I was I was trying when I was doing the mapping, I was like trying to look for all the all the fragmented signals, but there was not so many. Many this was the area I'm keeping now close to the annulus there. If we can get get some some okay, now it's stuck before. This is this is something you know it's stopped. Uh, perhaps I can go to that area and we can take take some some more points in this area here. Mm. So here we had it some some double potentials. But it's, it's now we looks have otherwise quite healthy. Slow okay, now we got it a slow tachycardia. Let's hope that we can get get some some idea of this. Remember now what was our settings here. Okay, this is what the what was the cycle length? Uh, four seconds. So this, is, this is even slower than it was in the beginning, mm -hmm. 470 already. Perhaps we get a little bit less. All right, let's let's take some some points and hopefully it stays for a while and we can get some idea. Okay, that is close to the annulus here. How do you facilitate inducibility in those patients? Same as in the normal population, or you? Yeah, more... usually, usually it's isoprenaline, and but this is this is a little bit tricky in a way that it keeps going and coming. So we can we can hope that it might be might be more stable during isoprenaline, but it, it's. No, what's happening? It doesn't take points. We lost the magnet vectors here completely. That's Maybe down, yeah, it may be that it's outside of the range. That still we don't have the vectors here. Huh? Okay, now it came back. No, no, it so it seems to be that sometimes we are getting out out of the range. So it was a little bit bad that it couldn't get any any points close to the annulus there. Because we were losing, losing the, it was out of the range with the magnetic field. Okay, now we are back to this area. It's a little bit fragmentation here. Okay, and we have a problem that it's it's atrial v ventricle activating about the same time, so it's a little bit tricky to make sure that which is which is A and which is B. Okay, almost getting inside the seat. Because it's, it's getting early there, but we have only 100 milliseconds so far here. <laughs> oh, let's see, is it getting getting something like a photo? Oh, it's getting inside the seat. All right, looping it around. Oh, it oh. stopped. <laughs> it stopped. Yeah, and now it's gone. Now it started again. We have another colleague that came to the lab and said, said that this looks like an avian. It, what, what I was telling in the beginning that when it had it this tachycardia, that it may be maybe an avian RT. Because it's it's quite nicely activated at the same time there. Yeah, it's obviously should be excluded in a certain moment yeah, or yeah. through. On the other hand, the, the registrations you showed uh, from the clinic um, are not necessarily this one. Um, yeah, it, it looks. I was looking that it may be maybe that there was a two to one conduction, so it, it fits better for the fast one cycle length around. Yes, less less than three hundred. That it, it looks like that. 
This is a little bit tricky now. So if you look look this is now let's put the other other area here also. We have the fast fast retrograde pathway, so it, it, it it's quite close to this what we have the earliest activation, and it, it really seems to be that it, it's it's getting getting like a focal focal activation here now. It, it doesn't really look like that we have any any macro reentry going on in this mm. this case now and the earliest activation these are the area on the top of each other so it looks like that it's, it's quite close to the this area so it may be maybe that we really have an avian attack going on in this this time yes which is actually not extremely uncommon in this population yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes very challenging to ablate yeah, now it's a question that is it is it better to ablate from from the pulmonary area or go go back to the <laughs> other side and ablate from there? Seems to be quite stable now. Oh, it stopped now. Mm -hmm. it didn't start again. I started. Okay, this is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is getting out of the range again. <laughs> Can't get any points. Cardo, Cardo is losing losing the area. Mm -hmm. I stopped. Yeah, well, we, we, we can try to paste paste during the tachycardia from the ventricle and get get some idea is it, is it really an avian or not? But it looks like that, and it, it's easy to induce this one. Mm. I stopped now. We can paste the ventricle and see that do we, do we get VAA or VAV? You can try it shortly now. But what, what does it do there? VAV. VAV. So maybe you can um, tell something about the diagnostic approach. Uh, I just looked at the list. I'm not sure that everybody is a um, fully trained electrophysiologist. There are sometimes fellows also. Maybe you can just explain what we do. Yeah, if we have an atrial tachycardia and we paste the ventricle there and drain it and then stop the pacing there, that if you have an atrial tachycardia, you can confirm it that you're stopping the ventricle pacing. And if you get a V, A, A, V, it cannot be rotating around that. It's, it's A and V and A and V and A and V all the time if you have an accessory pathway. And usually also for AV and RT, that it has to be always, always rotating to the atria to the ventricle, to the atria to the ventricle. But atrial tachycardia can go on that you have two atrias sequence to two atrias there that that cannot be any any accessory pathway and usually it means also that it cannot be any any avian rt and can you maybe show the findings one more time just to make it clear? so sorry thomas i missed you yeah just maybe you can enlarge the findings because of course we don't see it in a very large screen okay yeah yeah 
perhaps we, we can change the screen a little bit bigger here and Hannu can, can do a little bit pacing again. And Tommy is it. very good in it. <laughs> Okay, Hannu was pacing the ventricle. Stop pacing. Oh, you can show it there. So he stopped pacing ventricle here, activate, activating the ventricle here. Then we have atrial activation, ventricle activation, atrial activation. So it's a VAV. VAV, so it, it, it looks like that. It can be, can be a VNRT. Okay, let's take back the, what I did have the screen here. So it may be, no, we now, we got it, now we got it the other tachycardia. <laughs> <laughs> I was while. just telling that maybe, maybe we'll, we'll have another seat also, also still here, here in the right side it's a straight seat it's giving a little bit support we always like to use the straight seat to give a little bit support here for the magnet catheter there i was we had it so nice hist there that it might have been better better to take the catheter back to the yeah. right side and then try to find the find the nice nice slow pathway potential there but now it's sinus again and so this is this is not so <laughs> simple way now okay it's getting inside the seat i'll have to rotate it around to get get from here close to the, his area okay now i'm getting closer to the yeah, I, I, here yeah. let's try to find to find a slow pathway potential from the pulmonary atria there is but, his. Um, yeah but yeah that's that's my question because it i think it's very important to identify um because of course you see potentials from both uh, both sides yes. but um, uh, you really need to identify the where the cs and the tricuspid um, um, and the relation to the tricuspid valve to get really good on the um, um, slow pathway region and as you mentioned earlier you 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 thought that the cs is in this side right yeah yeah i'm not sure if i didn't even look for the during the mapping that maybe maybe that didn't really really get the catheter inside the CES. That was looking like that this is this is ventricle here. And now when I have the both atrias here, I'm quite close, close now. I will go a little bit lower. That's the his area. I will try to get a little bit lower in the area. Area like like tracing the slow pathway but as now we're getting it was quite nice for a while already there now we have only the ventricle there a little bit perhaps up now it's a bigger v i will pull it a little bit back this is the annulus area here in this this area Still a little bit, we don't have any atria there. I think I had it quite nice somewhere here. Oops. Okay, is it getting out of the range again? Not mm -hmm. yet. This would be bad if we are getting from this direction, it was getting out of the range. Looks like that it's, it's getting out of the cargo range again. <laughs> mm. This is this is getting complicated now that I can't can't really get the catheter there because it's getting out of the cardo range. Now it's coming back, now it's going away. So we are it, it should be quite nice with there, at least our angle there. Yeah. Yeah, actually, th that was my uh, question um, at the beginning, and maybe you can repeat this. Um, uh, this range issue is very important. Uh, uh, so, do you have any special um, tricks during the patient setup uh, to make sure that it, this time it happened, but that normally you avoid those? Um, 
issue. Yeah, it's, it's getting the risk is always I get the floor. We try to get get the area nicely, nicely that it covers everything. There. It, it looks from here. Let's put the normal range that we can see the dots there. It looks that we should be covering it nicely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's we are a little bit lower here. It seems to be that the category when it's getting getting to the event. now we can see that it's big V here, practically no A. It goes a little bit lower and then it's getting out of this this box there. Perhaps we could have put this a little bit lower. Then it's the risk that we lose lose something in the higher part there. But this is this is when you have mapping different chambers, you have multiple chambers, then then you may have everything doesn't fit here quite nicely in between these dots we have a nice little heart is here so it looks like that this is this is quite nice position here perhaps now yeah. we could say that it might be a little bit lower here yeah and i way. also would like to share with you i'm very happy with the comment of anders because he also thinks that this from the pulmonary venous atrium it's um probably safer and i also thought that from a tricuspid um well said it's um should be actually more appropriate yeah yeah that's true yeah, i just thought about so easy it. yeah go ahead it's like you had uh, quite good positions now of course it yeah is. i was hoping to get a little bit more atria here but it, it's, it's yeah. it yeah. looks anatomically it looks nice yeah and but also electrical uh, and it wasn't possible for you to to find the the coronary sinus yeah, I didn't try really, really in the left left side here. Here uh, on the right side, I didn't find it last time. I didn't find it find it this time. So I think that it starts from this this side side yeah. here. We, we can we can try to find it, but I don't know. Do we, do no, we want to spend, spend so much time for it? But you know the 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 heat signals are actually uh, uh, should be best in the red atrium in the pulmonary atrium whereas the his signals uh, you find in in the in the blue atrium in the baffle they actually originate from the anterior side of the the mitral area so so you it's should very dangerous for hard blood yeah, yeah here we have these, these are these are quite quite nice his, his potentials in this area so I, this, I believe the right right side is here this looks anatomically nice nice position for the slow yeah. pathway yeah i believe we had a couple of cases we did together with with the with the av nodal tachycardia that we ablated from the pulmonary atrium yeah yeah but i remember also also a couple of times that we ablated from the yeah. <laughs> other side there but this, this is this is quite nice i would like to have a little bit there's there's sometimes sometimes it looks like that we have an a here also yeah, yeah. But i think that this is a safe area perhaps we can try to ablate here see what kind of response we get get here because now now occasionally it comes and comes a nice like a fragmented signal here in the atria this this yeah. one looks like that we have a nice slow pathway area there this one is losing it so it may be that it's it's getting a little bit towards the ventricle there but i think we can try to try to do it here if everybody agrees and then we have to try to induce the other ones <laughs> <laughs> so if we get rid of the avian then we have still have a couple mm -hmm. other other macro oriented tachycardias but i will ablate here let's see. Yeah. yeah i think we can well, let's put it 35 and start with that and yeah. we will start with 35 watts and if it's we can increase it a little bit there that if it's looking looking nice and we give some some medication for the patient So it seems to be that we've been circling around for a couple hours now and coming back that we were suspecting in the beginning that we had an avian <laughs> the and then then coming back after a few other tachycardias that let's first ablate this one. <laughs> it's it's crazy. All right, we will start here. We don't get any, any junctional rhythm here, but it, it's it is this a little bit tricky that do we get it or not? I will move it, thinking that it's going towards the coronary sinus now, moving it a little bit more posterior. Somebody continues at the toilet. <laughs> I think it was Pete. Okay. 
just arrived in a hospital with some urgency. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I just rejoined from the car. I'll mute myself. Apologize. <laughs> That's the better version. Okay, we lost audio from Helsinki. Can you switch on back? Is it on now? Yeah, yeah no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I uploaded one one minute here. Didn't really get any any junctional beats there, but perhaps we can try try what's happening now that we get the slow tachycardia. Yeah. It's supposed to be an avian RT again, or is it only other tachycardia? Or so do we have to do a little bit more here? Okay, it's still okay. still coming, still, there. still coming. This is something that Thomas, you were asking last time when we went to Rotterdam that you ablate avian did during the during the tachycardia. I said no, no, I don't want to do it. But this might be something that I, I might want to do it because then it would be nice to see that it stops. Look, it's it's very it's very clear. I forbid to do that for uh, all fellows until the first thousand, and now I'm always doing it. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm always hesitating because when the tachycardia stops, the catheter always always tends to slip away. Not with stereotypes, by the way. But um... yeah, that's that's better contact here. Okay, now now we have a nice nice fragmented eight. There looks looks like the, almost like a slow pathway here. So let's let's try it here. In this case, of course, I would be very careful as well because anatomy is unpredictable. That's right. Yeah. Doesn't stop now. No. No effect. Should you try to find the CS anyway? Yeah, we can. We can yeah, try. This that. was my suggestion as well, and you can much better identify the location because the problem is you can find nice signals in a wide area yeah yeah i think we saw a slight acceleration during the ablation of the target okay. i might be wrong yeah i'm not going to measure it i i didn't i wasn't so carefully following i'm not going to check that was there any during the ablation was it was it getting getting any faster Oh, yeah. The other way to map is to just move your cases on north and, and see when you first see any heat signals. Yeah. And give yeah. you an idea about the, the field of, uh, of operation. Doesn't want to go any, any, anything. You know, it's getting you know, the cycling length is very stable, very yeah, okay. 470 all the time. <clears throat> okay, let's try to find a better history. It should be close to here. Now it's a little bit too much in the Adra side. Now we may sound a little bit um, <laughs> quiet, but of course, now it's just doing the job. Uh, so just yeah. some. Becker uh, is no way. finding a pathway region. Uh, AV now we have the, one of the fastest that got and, uh, Slightly irregular. Uh, no, now we're back in the Anilus area. 
I can't really read. Okay, now it's again to the same situation. It's mm -hmm. Telling us that we are out of the range. So, uh, Pekka, um, yes. it's a not, uh, I don't uh, mean it as, um, as challenging you, but uh, normally let's say that, forget that this is life case. Um, is there a, is there a um, case when you consider this as uh, the patient um, reached the level of point of no returns in, in terms of arrhythmia profile and, and you think that um, it's better just um, to stop the procedure and uh, oh, yeah. not going for all of those. Um, in, in, in these cases, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not so rare. Anders was here for a few weeks ago and I think we had a couple cases that we really mm -hmm. had to stop. That mm -hmm. There were so many tachycardias coming and coming and another tachycardia. Seems to be in the beginning and the mapping nicely one tachycardia ablating that we were happy. In the other one mapping that ablating seems to be all right. Then it's third one, fourth one. Finally, you have to really realize that this, this has to be stopped. It would yes, be nice, nice to see that. I would really like that. That what looks like an avian. I, I really, really would like to get rid of that. Perhaps we can now try to map this one. This is 290 milliseconds. Perhaps I can take some some points here then to see see that does it does it have a whole cycle length in this this trichospid area here? We, we can try to do that, but I'm, I'm a little bit now. afraid that mm. even it looks so stable now that it may be that after a few points it's not mm -hmm. anymore. Yes, and not everybody does do those procedures, but I think we we can share that um, a 70 75 percent acute success is relatively good and high. And on a five-year um, uh, follow-up, uh, another 30, um, even 40 percent of the patients developing um, either recurrences or other type of arrhythmia. So, yeah. uh, five-year five-year recurrences above the 60 percent is actually not a surprise in this procedure. So, uh, for the audience who is not familiar with those, I think it's very important to to show those cases, um, it's frustrating, but, um, and we do our best, but sometimes we just cannot do everything. Okay, I've been trying to go now around the annulus here, and so it seems to be that Around the annulus, we, we have only only 100 milliseconds here, so we are losing losing 200 milliseconds of the cycle length. So it, it doesn't look like that it's rotating here. Let's let's take it a little bit wider. But this is this is what we were suspecting that this might be going around around the atrium scar and scar area in the other side. Then we should have it activating possibly here in the pulmonary atria. Well, now it's getting a little bit later here. Do we really find something here? Now it's only me. Get another point there also. Okay, this looks nice, nice. It was signal. It's, it's quite late. Mm -hmm. ah. okay, let's go higher. We're getting quite early here. So mm -hmm. it, we are getting getting quite much of the cycle length now. Looked like in the beginning that we don't get the cycle length here around the animals. Now it looks much, much much closer we have already okay still missing oh, that's a little bit tricky now that we can't really see what is that no, but this is getting no. in the middle there so it doesn't really have a nice nice this should get later 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 there's a possibility that we have something mm -hmm. something going around here this should be okay it's there Ah, it may be that we have a. This must be better flutter here. 
Okay, let's go more here. Okay, it's too much of the ventricle. We can find that spot here. We can do entrainment when we're having a nice, nice atria here. Okay, now we're getting this. This is this is quite late atria here. Not extremely late, but yeah, this is. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking that we have a nice, nice a here close to the annulus. Here we can try to do entrainment. I'm going to try. I'll put the marker here that it's a pacing slide. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we can capture here. Okay. It's not captured. Was it capturing? No. No. Running through. Yeah, we can see here. Can't get um, it. Might be now. Um, Looking there. Yeah. We can't really, really get a nice capture there. Let's try once more. Let's put 15 million yeah. there. Yeah. It seems to be that it was capturing. Ah. It changed. It went to oh, sinus. <laughs> it stopped the tachycardia. This is, this is the problem with the entrainment. It can stop it. I think you had entrainment with fusion, not not concealed entrainment. So, so the, the the relation between the local signal and the CS markers uh, reversed. So, so uh, you you uh, that's the reason why yeah, you're right. Out. You're right. When you're looking from here, it, it is reversing the CS sequence. You're right. Yeah. So we can't confirm that, but it, it looked like that we got it early. It's also, late almost here. Also, during mapping, we saw some double potentials uh, uh, actually quite wide to be spread. So. Yeah. yeah. So it would be nice, nice to ablate and stop it. IVC is here, so we should do, do a line. We already did a couple, couple points, in fact, <laughs> in the area we should mm -hmm. do the line here because we were trying to trying to ablate the slope pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's nice, nice, now we have a nice, nice small V, that was big V and small A here. So if we want to get it, this is, this is the other side, the IVC is starting, starting here, so we should get, get a complete line here. Mm -hmm. Any better ideas? on the isthmus line here yeah you you i, I think probably that's good for any reason in these patients yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe that we will get rid of the slow pathway conduction also at the same time <laughs> yeah. if, if something and let, let's do a line here right try to see that what we have after that and of course it may be that we'll have to go go and ablate also from the other side but it's not with for the watch now. Yeah. Okay, okay. If you curve your CS reference catheter, you might uh, get close to what could be the orifice of the coronary sinus, and that would uh, uh, you could do the the, the ablation during pacing and uh, follow the. Yeah. The... Yeah, I, I really didn't find it. This is this is now towards the oracle here for the CS catheter. I, I really tried to try to get it from the right side. You mean from here? I, I really didn't get it, and we spent it long, long time last time. But, but if you curved it uh, in in the blue atrium, you you could probably get quite close, so you actually were able to to validate. You mean just to, just just to have it for in the loop? Yeah, 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 that's that. Yeah, yeah, we can do it that way. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, okay, yeah. So. You can. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. So we can oh. make make a, make a loop there, and hopefully we'll have a nice nice atrium there. 
this was the area that we got it a nice stable area. That's why we selected to put it here to be able to do, do some mapping there. But we can try to loop it and get it. Uh, we can even get it get it to the other side of the isthmus area if it's not getting, getting any nice signals here in the septal side. No. Yeah, Hanno is trying to position to see as cut again and let's hope that we will find a nice Are you getting inside the CS? At least it's very close now. Now it's slip. That might be a good, good, good position for pacing from the distal there. It's it's a funny now that we can see that CS. There's there's some some delay here between these CS positions there. The nine and ten very late compared for one and two. But now perhaps we can we can try to pace it from here and see. What we got it. It may be, yeah. At least it's in the Ostial area there. And let's go for number one. Let's slow down. Oh shit, it's not. Eka, one of you can um, always comment and explain what you do, that it will, will be more, um, of course, we can follow it, but at least a little bit clearer what yes. this is. And uh, Hanno was trying to trying to get, get the catheter close to the CSOS here, but Hanno was suggesting that we can do it in the CS pacing, perhaps seeing better when we get, get some, some block there. So it looks like that we got it to CS catheter this this multiple catheter close to the area where cs should be i was trying to pace first one and two it was big age right there now it seems to be bigger in three and four let's let's try to pace from there so we were trying to find the position for the catheter which would be quite stable stable and on the other side on the this this time it would be on the medial side of the isthmus there that to be able to, but this is this is quite unstable you can see that we have big a and then we have practically no a so I try again that it, it's it's a little bit tricky to get the capture here. Oh, thank you. Another thing might be that we can loop the catheter to the other other side here here like like this, but I can, I can still we can now it's pacing, but now it's not. So it, it's. Yeah, So and going back to the strategy a little bit, um, of course. Um, okay, now we have it. It's a little bit. It's not so far away. I try to pace now from the distal CS. So what makes it here very difficult and complex that uh, it's switching from one to another one. So having said this, what what uh, are you going to do with an AB node, uh, or you are convinced that it's. Maybe no, okay. I, I think we will we will do the isthmus line here. These these spots are there, and then we will try to induce it again. If we can't get it, because now it it's, it seems to be that we can get almost two x at the same time. But ablating here, we will go through also the slow pathway area. Yes. Do you understand what I mean? These are the spots we ablated. If I'm ablating from here towards the IVC here, we should be going through this. Yes. But we'll have to try to induce it again and. Yes. 
Is yeah, it stopped that, or not? Very clear. And one more question. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you focus on the Carto screen and, and uh, for the audience, especially the ones who are not using this system, it is very important to um, show and then you can see that on this big Odyssey screen, you can place uh, many inputs, including the Carto and uh, in yeah. this case, the Carto is fully integrated. Um, on the left um, panel, you see yeah, the stereo taxi screen with an um, uh, ablation spot, uh, ablation history it's called. Um, and I wonder which, um, which screen you use during the ablation and how much uh, you take the ablation history into account during your ablations. Yeah, always having this, this ablation history here. We're looking, looking at this and I, I was setting this is 475 and I usually, usually it's around 400. But we will try to get the lesion. We have to believe that it's a good lesion when we get it get it above 400. So we'll try to get this area more more looking looking for the color here. I like to get a dark orange there. So then it's it's above the 400. Now we can see that when the cat is moving here, it's giving that in this this spot there's ablation history is giving 200 watt seconds. We're moving a little bit away. There's no ablation here. 250 here. If I'm getting getting it a little bit closer there. So I, I we, we believe that this ablation history is giving giving nice information for us. It, it's a good good tool. Tool and here we can see the catheter there. Usually it's this this when you have all these arrows coming coming from the tip there, it means that you have a good contact. It's it's not actually measuring the contact, but it's measuring the impedance and other things there and giving giving an index that this is in in contact. I can try because sometimes it's a little bit tricky to get it less contact there that I can try to pull it a little bit back that like here now it's a okay now I went back you you show for a while that there was half of these arrows there so it means that there has some contact there but not so good contact so it, it's a little bit it's an additional information which is it's is valuable it's like doing doing manual cases with a smart that's scattered that you are looking for the ablation index and try to get it get it good, good numbers in that so it, it's it's about the same and we, we really believe that it's a valuable tool you should use it okay i'm in the annulus there but perhaps we can't really it didn't really paste there i don't know why well i'll try it again and Yeah, we can't really get the nice, nice continuous spacing from the CS catheter there. It would be nice to be able to get, get it nicely, to be able to verify that if we have some, some block there. But it seems to be that it's, it's fluctuating all the time, that big A, big A and small A. And, but this, this looks, we can try even 15 milliamps there. Yeah, it seems to be the first beat. Now it's pacing for a couple of beats and then it's losing it. Another possibility, perhaps Hanno, you can try try to loop it to the other side. That if we can get a nice atria from the other side of the isthmus, isthmus pacing from the other other side there, we should be able to see see some something then. It's it's still in this area. It's it's a, some some conduction block now between the proximal and distal there proximal very early distal very late compared with this okay let's try once more uh -oh. We can't really get it, getting nice, nice capture. So I think that we, we will try to do the line until until here, this this part here. This is this is the right side here. And IVC should be starting here. So I, I try to ablate until here, and then we will try to get some some area that we can we can pace and see do we really get something. So I will start from here. Let it be, Hanno. I will start from here. Yeah, it's losing the CS contact completely.
Oh, it's getting unstable. Hopefully we can ablate that it doesn't go outside of the range again. You can see in the ablation history that there's some some movement also it's unstable and maybe the breading and things like that. So it's it's not a nice, nice narrow line there. It's a little bit more. Although it's very clear um, that the delivered RF energy is um, is increasing there, so that's uh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. There's a little gap there, but otherwise it's quite okay. Looks very yeah, it's yeah this is Pete. Uh, I would comment too. The ablation history certainly is very helpful being able to see the amount of energy uh, delivered and, and uh, we'll often watch that very carefully. And that's one of the great advantages of using an integrated mapping system uh, is to be able to see uh, the ablation history. One thing as far as the contact indicator, maybe for those of us in North America, we do not have the contact indicator as of yet in the US. And uh, I think that that is something that we're very much looking forward to and hopefully we'll have with the new ablation catheter. But maybe you all in Europe, could comment just on the the change in your practice. What you see is the advantage of having that contact indicator. You know, everything we've accomplished up until now has been without any contact indicator, right? So I think it's which is remarkable. But uh, I think it's a step forward that's significant as well to have that. Yeah, it it it, it helps a little bit. There, but if you're using it, for example, during atrial fibrillation, ablation, it's almost all the time having a nice nice contact indicator there. And then we have some some problems that when you are mapping mapping ischemic VTs, for example, and we are in the scar area, I think the impedance is changing there, and then we can't really trust on this. And that's why you can you can put the history also working in a way that it, it's taking the history only when you have a good contact. We are we not using that, especially in the ischemic cases, because it may be may be fooled, and we don't see getting in the middle of the myocardial infarction and. It seems, seems that there's no contact. Then you look, look, look at the floor and you can see that cadet is really bending around. So oh, that's very interesting nice, because of the impedance, yeah. huh? Yeah, very yeah. interesting. And we have some, some problems also when doing epicardial cases that the impedance seems to be a little bit different there that we don't really have a nice, nice, nice impedance measurements. And so the contact flows, the contact, contact indicator might not work perfectly there in those, in those areas. Uh, okay, I lost a little bit the uh, isthmus area here and try to get it nicely back there. It was so stable it there now it's, it's a little bit tricky. In a, v, in, a v, a in a VT, in a VT is um, I agree there are some experiences like that V2, but I think everybody, if you are in a dense only if you are in a dense car region. Yeah. But um, on the other hand, in the AFib. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a game changer. We analyzed all of our data and um, especially the fact that we can do the procedures within one hour, it, 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 it's really thanks to the contact indicator and the high uh, first pass isolation that we never had before the contact indicator. Actually, I think it's the biggest achievement um, in the last years in this technology. Yeah, it, it's helpful in a way, but mostly what, what I was telling in the beginning, mostly when you are in the atria, it's, it's almost all the time you have it like this. I think it's, it's a good feature for the magnetic catheter that the contact force is not extremely high, but when you have the catheter nicely positioned there, and then you start moving it, bending, bending the vector there, it, it stays nice contact there. Yeah, it's yeah I, I think, I think... it's moving, then it's, it's time to move yeah, it again. Yeah, I agree. And then I think one of the why is that so important in my practice is that I always do continuous lesions and um, that gives the confidence during the moving that you don't lose the contact. And I think I agree with you if somebody is still doing um, like, for instance, old fashioned uh, point by point for that is less important because this gives a good, uh, good contact. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah I, that, that's, a, that's a good point. I'm also also doing tracking the catheter all the time. So then you can see that it still stays there. Nice, nice contact there. Yeah, 
Pitäisikö me antaa pari tonnia aina? Don't forget that Hungarians understand Finnish. <laughs> 2000. Did you understand 2000 units more heparin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought it was 2500, but it's... Um, just, yeah, you uh, misunderstood it completely. <laughs> 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 Big difference between our languages. Sometimes I think the tone for the Finnish and Hungarian language is about the same. You don't understand any word there, but it is somehow the tone is mm -hmm. so familiar that yes. you may think that okay, this, there, there's some roots behind. Now oh, he's taking a little bit deeper breaths and then it goes. Mm -hmm. There's a gap still in the middle of the line. So, do you mind if I uh, introduce uh, David uh, uh, to the yes. audience? He oh, joined uh, the panelists. I think we can. We can. Even if we want to start start from Arizona for the cases, then we can we can go for that, and we, we can try to finish this line, and then perhaps we can comment comment later on what's what's going on. And I think that's that's a reasonable way to do it. I try to get this this hole here, what you can see in the ablation history. I can I try to fulfill it that, and then we'll try to find a place that we can get get something facing facing close to the line, and hopefully we can verify that there's something at least delay or block in the in the line. And that's a very good use again. Yeah, that's a very good plan. So what I would like to propose uh, to show one more time the movie about the genesis and asking David to make some comments about this and. Uh, how he sees these last developments um, from the strategy point of view and uh, what we can expect in the future. Introducing Genesis RMN, Stereotaxis' latest innovation in robotic intervention. Genesis is a leap forward in robotic technology and represents the future of electrophysiology. With redesigned magnets and a novel mechanism of action, patients, physicians, and hospitals can benefit from the differentiated benefits of robotic magnetic navigation in an architecture that is now smaller, lighter, faster, and more flexible. Included with Genesis is an advanced proprietary X-ray system specifically designed for electrophysiology. Stereotaxis Imaging Model S incorporates modern flat panel detector technology to reduce radiation and provide clear image quality. It is designed to be robust and reliable and includes a broad range of features including beam collimation, adjustable frame rates, a variable SID and more. The Genesis RMN system utilizes smaller magnets that rotate along their center of mass. This allows for unprecedented responsiveness to the physician's control. Across a broad range of navigational routines, the Genesis system is 70 to 80 percent faster than Niobe. The entire system is significantly smaller and designed to improve the patient and lab experience with greater access to the patient during the procedure. The full suite Genesis RMN system provides the most advanced capabilities in robotic magnetic navigation in a more accessible and affordable package. Visit our website at stereotaxis.com to learn how the Genesis RMN system can drive patient care and practice growth at your hospital. Hi, good afternoon, uh, everyone in Europe, and good morning, everyone in the US. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Becca. Good morning. So you saw this so, Genesis introduction. Can you comment on it? Um, Sure. I guess uh, it has been, I have to say, kind of a, a representing the Stereotexas team that worked very hard to develop this innovation and many other innovations. It is really nice to see the procedure this morning um, and to see kind of our, our efforts actually being used in the real world to cure patients and to help, uh, to help physicians. And so it's just, uh, I want to thank you for doing this broadcast and for allowing the team here to see their work in action. Um, you asked a little bit, um, uh, Thomas, about kind of 
what we've been up to, what we've been focused on from an innovation perspective. And as you know, over the last few years, this has really been kind of one of our major, our focuses has been driving forward every aspect of the technology in, uh, in substantial ways. And I think kind of one of the big goals of, uh, uh, of kind of our innovation is obviously to improve patient care, to improve the physician experience, but also to make robotics much more accessible uh, and affordable. And uh, some of the things that you see in the lab uh, today are, are part of that effort of making things easier to uh, install, easier to place more broadly in hospitals, uh, more affordable for hospitals. And, um, and I hope over time this allows us to see a future where robotics is broadly used in electrophysiology and beyond. And, um, and kind of in, what I would just also say is that kind of in everything we do, there's also um, reasons for the innovation that support future innovations. And so I see that kind of we are, we're continuing to work hard on many topics, uh, on interventional devices, on software, on connectivity technology, uh, on robotics. And, um, and I hope kind of it will be a continued period for, for several more years of, uh, of many, many kind of positive improvements. Thank you. And um, uh, having said this, and uh, you uh, aware of the content of this movie we showed, um, can I challenge you with one question? Because I think it's very important to, uh, to clarify, uh, because um, you guys developed this new system, which is pretty fast. And we see it during the movement of the catheter that the um, reaction is um, very immediate without any delay. So when you change vector of movement, it, it reacts very fast. And um, when, you, when you talk to the physicians, the two physicians already having access to this, um, they not necessarily recognize it in a practice. Uh, and I think it's very important that you clarify that there's this speed difference is there. And um, Pekka mentioned that the previous version was already so good that um, sometimes it's very difficult to, to realize the difference uh, between the fantastic and the very good. Can you comment on this and, and, sure. and clarify this speed difference? Because I think it's very important. Sure. So let's. So when we talk about the speed, we mean the difference between when a physician on the computer screen is moving the vector until this translates into an actual change in the magnetic field where the patient's chest is. And it's only through this change of the magnetic field that the catheter can move. And if you remember originally, and, and you're all kind of in the early years uh, uh, pioneering uh, uh, robotics, uh, and so you remember that in the early years, there was a significant latency of maybe three seconds or so between when you would move on the computer screen and it would actually translate into catheter motion. And this was obviously a major barrier to, to running an efficient practice. With Niobe, uh, when we made the motor stronger and improved the control software around 2012 timeframe, I believe, then it was reduced to uh, under a second about a second this lag time to the point where you can do highly efficient procedures as we saw a couple months ago when you did the master class uh, Thomas and and you were able to do very very efficient uh, uh, procedures when we look at Genesis and um, what we did to measure the speed difference is that we took many of, of your procedures of procedures from uh, physicians actual procedures and we looked at given that it's a robot we have a record of every movement that was done in the magnetic field over the course of a real procedure. And we measured this um, for many different types of procedures, many different routines, and, and how long it takes for the Genesis robot versus the Niobe Epic robot to, uh, to run an entire procedure, different procedures. And it ends up being almost a fairly consistency of, of about a 70 to 80% uh, faster time for the Genesis robot to go through the entire procedure. Now, it depends obviously in your practice how you're using the Genesis robot. So if you're moving to one place and then you're staying there and then you're moving to the next and you're staying there, or if you're trying to do very gradual uh, movements of the line, you might not feel it because you're not, you're not testing the speed aspect of the robot. But let's say if you wanted to do broad mapping and to move the catheter wildly to different sides of the chamber. 
I'm certain that you should feel a difference uh, in those types of routines. And, and, and I think there's also an aspect of perception. When you, when you sit for a period behind a computer that's working very quickly and responsively, you don't sense that it's fast. You just don't sense that there's a lag time. When you sit behind a computer for long periods of time and there's a, there's a tiny lag, at some point you, you get used to it. You've done thousands of procedures with it. You get used to it. But when you go then again in front of a, a very quick computer, you can sense the difference in the beginning and then you get used to it again very quickly. Yeah, thank you. And I, uh, I, I really wanted to make sure that people understand in the audience that there is the difference and it's a further improvement, uh, even if the perception is not always um, uh, like that. Uh, and um, in the meantime, I really got um, many messages already informally that uh, many people just want wants the genesis, even the ones who have the old ones. So that's nice, uh, nice um, presentation. Thank you. And we go back to Helsinki, and um, very soon uh, we need to summarize the case. So I give back the word to yeah. Becca and to. He, he will explain uh, as well. Is it the already on stage of the procedure? Yeah. Yeah. So we get it, get it now a little bit faster. Tachycardia around 300 millisecond cycle length. There, we got it, got it. This line before the tachycardia started, we had it some some delay here when pacing close to the line here. It was 140 milliseconds delay delay in this area. So our plan is now that we will we will pull the catheter back to the right side and then we will ablate a little bit more from the right side in the same same area and hopefully we can stop stop that tachycardia if it's not stopping stopping i think we will stop the case so the next step is that we will go go and try to ablate the isthmus from the from the right side where we started so we'll still have the other seat uh, we will leave this seat still in the pulmonary atria and then take the ablation catheter here and try to try to go go to the same area from the other side so that's very that's nice. the plan but very you nice can, you can call with the case in arizona and i will i will give a comment there that we get anything going on so i think that we will try try to work with this around 20 30 minutes and then then if we can't get it we'll have to give up thank but you hopefully but uh, this you, point will be successful but uh, pekka before you go away or before you just continue, um, I understand from stereotaxis that they have a little surprise for you guys. Uh, I don't know whether it's ready. Please give me confirmation. Tommy, are you ready? Yes. That's the first uh, oh, okay. remote award winning in the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this looks nice. Thanks a lot for everybody. Everybody gave it just two, wor two words without delaying oh, yeah. the procedure. That yeah. Means. Yeah. So I can't. I can't see the video of you, uh, Pekka. I'm. I'm sorry, but. Uh, oh, I put it there. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we. Uh, we wanted to celebrate uh, your your big milestone of having accomplished you and the entire uh, Helsinki uh, University team. Uh, really, it is a team effort. Um, uh, the milestone of having treated 2,000 uh, uh, patients, it is a very impressive milestone. Uh, it reflects kind of a really how much of a big impact you have on the patients. Uh, on many patients across the across Finland and uh, and for a long period of time, and so we really wanted to celebrate this big milestone with you. Um, sorry, we couldn't celebrate it in person, but we hope that this is kind of a uh, a nice opportunity given the restrictions of visiting you in person. And um, and I, I think more broadly, I I wanted to also celebrate kind of your your pioneering spirit. Uh, and I think kind of today's case. Uh, uh, is a reflection of that and, and generally the interactions that we've been able to have over the last uh, few years has really kind of uh, made that very clear that you pioneer the future and you do so in a way where uh, you, you do it based on a conviction of what you believe is the right thing and what you 
I believe is the right thing for your patients and what's the right thing for the industry and for the future. And, um, and uh, we see it in the type of patient that you chose to treat today, which is a very complex, difficult case. Uh, we see it in, uh, in obviously how uh, you were the first in the world uh, to adopt Genesis and, and really kind of to, to trust us that our innovations will be good. Uh, that we will deliver on our promises and to work with us to make sure that the technology does improve and to get better and we really appreciate this help and um, and you've done it also in the past when we saw the live case from dubai to, to helsinki uh, and and i just want to say thank you again for, uh, for being a pioneer uh, thank you for working uh, kind of with us to improve the technology and improve medicine and for being a real friend in this process Thanks, David, for your kind kind words. That is, I'll have to emphasize that this is this is teamwork. I, I'm not doing this alone here. We have excellent excellent stuff here. Hannu, Hannu is doing difficult cases together with me. We have a nice nice operators for the stereo taxis, Apo Aro, Petri Korhonen, very very experienced, and we will try to get get the younger ones involved also. So thanks thanks, David, and this is this is nice that you. Um, recognize us that we have done, done a lot of work, but everything is teamwork and we need all the nursing team and every, everybody is important in this. I can't do anything by myself. But you can continue with the Arizona case. We will try to update from the right side a little bit and then, then we will join, join a discussion with, with Hannu and tell, tell what really happened afterwards. There. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so we did some, some ablations. We ablated in the right right side also we did, did the isthmus line completed the isthmus line there we got it got it a nice block that there was a delay delay more than 140 milliseconds there facing facing from the other side of the line but unfortunately we were still able to get get one additional tachycardia going on and then we base converted that and after that we finished finished the case we were not able to induce the avianity anymore anymore and it seems to be that we got it a block in the common common isthmus ablations were done both both on the pulmonary atria and on the other side of the atria so there's quite long long lines that i can't now anymore get it get it there's some some pictures so we started the line line and completed the line there and then then after pacing we are quite positive with Hannu that we got a block in the line there but unfortunately one more tachycardia was still still going on and we Base converted that and stopped the case during that phase. So there was multiple tachyarrhythmias, and we are hoping that we got some some of those treated, and the patient will be feeling well, but not a complete result. Thank you very much. Um, it was a great case, very challenging, and I I'm also pretty sure, based on my experience, that um, even if it's not completely, I think it can help the patient uh, a lot. And thanks again yeah. for sharing, sharing with us. Thanks a lot. And we are eagerly waiting for the other case from Arizona now. Thanks.